into the fast lane with Globe's 5G technology. It's fast, it's fun, it's wonderful. It's Kim Son Ha approved. With Globe 5G technology, the possibilities are endless. It's about time we inspire the youth to create something meaningful, spark reinventions, and improve the framework of the future. That's what the 5G hackathon is about. Students, professionals, and startups are welcome to join the event by registering using this link. Once accepted, you may enjoy access to the GLOBE 5G Hackathon HQ, where the enablement workshops will happen. That's two weeks worth of fun workshops and mentorship by industry experts from our tech partners. All these to get you to the top. That doesn't end there. Apply what you learn from the workshops and pitch your idea on how you can use 5G to improve the way we live. The panel will pick the top 30 semi-finalists to join the pitch competition and enjoy exclusive workshops and consultations with mentors. But if you're truly, madly, deeply at the top of your game, you can be chosen as part of the top 10 finalists who will proceed to the Hackathon Finals. Three of the best pitches will be hailed as winners. What's in it for you? Well, over 500,000 pesos worth of prizes will be given away, plus a chance to be part of the Venture Builders program of 917's Venture Velocity and work directly with Globe 5G Acceleration Lab. This is powered by Globe and Animal Labs by DLSU. Thanks to 5G, we're about to achieve great heights. Click the link and show us what you've got. Get ready to reinvent your power to create change. Register now. Do you want to make a difference and reinvent your world? 네, 안녕하세요. 여러분, 김선호입니다. 샌드박스 같은 곳에서 경쟁하는 기분을 느껴보고 싶으신가요? 그렇다면 글로브 5G 해카톤에서 진행하는 워크샵과 멘토십을 통해 5G 활용 방법을 만들어보고 여러분의 친구, 동료들과 팀을 만들어서 디지털 시대 속 필리핀의 새롭고 흥미로운 가능성을 열어보세요. Follow your dream. Register now. Take it to the next level with Globes Fiber, LTE Advanced, and 5G Mobile Connection. Now you have the power to reinvent your world. Globe. The, the new, new mind-blowing mind surf for all 9-9? 9 gig? All sites? For all devices? Shareable with up to four people? Like my family? They are? The new 
mind blowing surfer all nine nine. Dear Mother, Light of the Home. Dad. Hey, baby. Greetings, Professor Rodolfo. May I be absolved from Mac Club tomorrow? The Globe Virtual Hangouts kasi. Go and hang out from wherever you are. Just open the Globe One app, choose an event, and click join. Watch concerts online. Woo! Dance together. We can do quiz dance. <gasps> Yo, let's go! If, uh, if you allow me, I promise to make it up to you and repay your kindness tenfold. <laughs> Truly, your favorite child. I love you, Dad. Me, me. Please, babe. Thank you, sir. Enjoy your fave events with low prepaid virtual hangouts all together now. Hello, I'm Bambi Escalante, Managing Director of HPE Philippines. In this session, I'm going to talk about edge computing and why it is key to enterprise digital transformation journey. I won't be able to take live questions during the session, so please put your questions in the chat box and I'll try to address it or follow up with you individually. First, let me share my screen. Today, we're going to talk about how business is transforming and how the transformation is taking place primarily at the edge. Let's begin our discussion by looking at what's driving this important transformation. We are seeing technology and IT strategies becoming more decentralized. The next frontier of IT is now moving business critical workloads and data sets out of the data center and down from the clouds to where the business is transacted, which is at the edge. There is a growing trend where as more data comes from IoT devices, even on-prem data centers might be too far from the action. What exactly is the edge? Is the factory floor, the hospital, the office building, the oil rig, or even your homes. It's anywhere that isn't a data center or service provider cloud. The edge is where people, devices, data, and things intersect. Where we live and work, where personalized connections are made, where new experiences are powered. Edge computing is about running applications at the edge of the Wi-Fi, and 4G or 5G mobile networks. I will provide a little bit more context about edge computing. Most of you may be familiar with data center computing, but in the old days, it is about outfitting the four walls of the data center. Then came organizations starting to outsource management to somebody else, which ushered in cloud computing. Both of them are centralized concepts. What we are seeing now is edge computing, which is the opposite. It is a decentralized concept. Instead of moving compute and data in a data center, 
whether public cloud providers or the company's own, a new thing is emerging, taking computing and net networking out of the data center and pushing it to locations that are closer to where transactions are taking place. Edge computing is the third wave, and it's already promising to revolutionize how everyone on the planet is doing business. We're moving out from centralized to decentralized paradigm. In just two years, there will be 55 billion of such devices globally. And as you can imagine, now that it is so easy to capture vast amounts of detailed data, how we make good use of it becomes the new challenge. From small temperature and pressure sensors to high resolution or high frame rate cameras. We hear all the time about data explosion and the more data we have, the better decision making we can achieve if we can make sense of the data. To do so quickly, it should be analyzed where the data is created at the edge. Half of all the data we create as a society will be processed at the edge. So the old days of the data center or even the cloud being the center of the universe is shifting to the edge. So it's important that we all understand what is edge computing because it is going to drive the next level of business transformation. Let's look at the benefits of edge computing. Edge computing is driven by capturing rich data at the edge of the enterprise, where the actual business activity takes place. The large amount of real-time data is what's driving it. You heard of the word data gravity. The more data one has, the longer it takes to move it. So edge computing moves the computers to where the data is being born, at the edge. What then are the benefits of edge computing? First, by making the edge smart, decisions can be made right then and there in real time. Second, all the data needed is right there. No cloud connection needed. That means you can be autonomous. The business can be out there, capture the data, make the decisions, and correct what's going on in real time without being tethered to the cloud. It doesn't mean cloud computing does not serve a function. It still does. But companies are no longer beholden to the cloud to get things done. If the data stays local to where it is created, it has less chance of falling into the wrong hands. Businesses can have increased security and deliver compliance. The critical reason to decentralize and move the edge is to improve operations and increase return on investment or ROI. When a company moves to an edge-driven strategy, it is not uncommon for such companies to realize a doubling in key metrics, such as output or experience, having error rates and wasted resources. As these edge-driven results are delivered in early transformation to an edge-driven enterprise, the next step is naturally to scale the concept company-wide. The key point to understand edge computing is that timing matters. Why are all these not in the cloud or the data center? Simply put, the travel, the data mistake, or what we call the data transfer, it takes time. The more data at the edge, the more decisions can be made, assuming we can make sense of it. But making sense of data means it has to be transferred to another location or to another data center, and it will be outside of this time envelope to make a fast decision. The decision loop must complete data capture, data analysis, and implement an action within this window of opportunity. If the process takes too long, the opportunity has vanished and is lost. Production lines, autonomous driving, catching thefts, all those are time-dependent or time-sensitive activities. In those situations, businesses cannot afford a data transfer delay and need to make decisions in real time to get a successful outcome. As more nuanced data leads to better decisions, the time it takes to transfer the captured data set to a central compute entity, such as the data center or public cloud, just takes too long. What edge computing does is that it removes the data transfer delay, making new operations at the edge feasible. 
A good example of where edge computing with real time makes sense is a grocery store. Often, a supermarket station has CCTVs, and multiple cameras are not unusual to overlook aisles or checkout counters. Traditionally, they were all connected to a video recording facility that stored recordings for some time before they were overwritten. When something happened, for example, there's a shoplifter, you would go back and look at the recording. But that situation is already done. With the transformation of digital cameras, it's now possible to introduce video analytics, discover and detect anomalies in near real time, and generate alerts. This video analytics should happen locally, as transporting 10 to 20 video streams back to a central site is very costly and not very efficient. With edge computing, video analytics can happen in near real time. So alerts, alarms, or whatever immediate security intervention can be done if there is an actual shoplifting that is taking place. Having the edge deployed, there may be other applications that could be relevant to run locally over time, such as this picture with augmented reality navigation application, showing shopping list items and find sale special price. Because real-time decision-making and action-taking is a universally desirable capability, intelligent edge computing has broad applicability. In the financial industry, it has made high-frequency algorithmic trading feasible, making markets more efficient. In healthcare, doctors now diagnose patients and provide instant remedies and procedures saving lives. In retail, now we see the emergence of automated stores with no checkout counters or checkout lines saving shoppers time. In the entertainment industry, we now see customized experiences and new autonomous rides further enhancing leisure. In manufacturing, the way we produce goods and services are being digitally transformed to deliver better product with less waste. In the telecom industry, 5G is being combined with decentralized microdata centers and LADN to ensure the right data is available in the right place. In the oil and gas industry, leak detection and equipment malfunction is now closely monitored and quickly rectified by leveraging distributed and automated systems. In the public sector and in defense, safety and security are now being enhanced by real-time decision-making in a distributed and digital battlefield. It's hard to find any sector or area of human endeavor that is not being redefined by embracing intelligent edge computing. In this slide, we show two important vectors or dimensions, time and data. With this, we can begin to understand the requirements for a successful edge computing strategy. On the x-axis, notice that the lower reaction time is needed, the more edgy the processing is. If we take the intersection of the short reaction time with heavy data processing on the y-axis, it will require looking at machine learning and artificial intelligence, or ML and AI. If you have very short period of time to react and you have a heavy influx of highly nuanced data, you will very likely most make use of real-time machine learning. This is true in manufacturing, self-driving cars, and other autonomous operations. Reaction time is measured in microseconds. This is where a lot of companies can create business value with edge computing. Of course, in the middle or medium speed and data processing, we still have use cases that can benefit application and data aggregation. Example, the company is a retail operation where there is less amount of data flowing in from their point of sale or POS terminals to a central computer in the back room. The re reaction time is measured on more of a human scale, like less than a second. In this case, you're typically not using AI and machine learning, but you're aggregating data and distributing your applications to the actual store. And finally, if you have light data flow and a lot of time, 
by which to process it. It is more than like the classic IoT world where we are seeing more people deploying putting remoting sensors. Here, acceptable reaction time can easily be minutes. Many folks have thought that IoT is just about data capture and sending the data all the way to the cloud for processing. So that may be true if it's just a sensor to check air quality, sending it back to the data center for analysis. We don't care that much if it takes a few minutes for the round trip. But the more we care about the round trip, the tighter the decision loop, the higher hierarchy with more business value that can be created. So consider the business value factor when you're thinking of ideas for the hackathon. The decision loop from data and analytics to decisions being made and action taken, the higher the possibility of improving outcomes. Value is a function of how quickly can you get things done. Depending on the time allowed inside the decision loop, edge computing falls into three distinct categories, machine learning and artificial intelligence, application and data integration, third, data capture. An edge computing strategy may involve all three, and the data center or cloud plays a variant role depending on the allowed time inside the decision loop. In the next few slides, let's look at the value of combining edge computing with AI to different industries. Advances in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning are pushing the boundaries of what's possible in both business and our everyday lives. In 2019, 451 Research conducted their Voice of the Enterprise AI and Machine Learning Survey. The first significant finding is already shown here in the slide. Additionally, 32% of respondents cited the AI technology as a top IT priority in 2019. And 48% said that budgets for AI and machine learning projects will increase in subsequent budget cycles. Additionally, early adopters of AI are already seeing the impact of the technology. 43% said the technology has improved customer experiences, and 37% cited gains in competitive advantage as a benefit. In the next few slides, I'll zero in three industries, retail, financial services, and smart cities, and how edge computing with AIML will have a high impact to give you further appreciation and probably ideas for the hackathon. First is retail. This slide highlights just some of the challenges in the retail ecosystem that are underpinned by data. The pandemic has significantly disrupted retail's business operation and pressed the need to evolve to a new normal. The continued challenge in improving customer experience and in-store technology to prevent losses also abound. Edge computing and AI offer a tremendous accelerator for the modernization and improvement of all aspects, systems, processes, services, of the retail ecosystem and for all the actors that operate there. AI and analytics in the retail sector is very much an edge to core or cloud continuum. But for the purpose of discussion, let's look at the left side where AI and analytics can make a difference at the store level from point of sale and self-checkout to helping protect the health and safety of both customers and employees while shopping and working to uncovering insights at the store level. Here are the potential use cases for edge computing and AI ML for the retail challenges that we have mentioned, where new software solutions can be designed. First, in point of sale and shrinkage, there could be miscanning, employee or shopper theft, track and tracing, baseline, baselining normal and abnormal activities. Under health and safety, which is something that we all can relate to, security and access control, tracking of employees, fever detection, social distance tracing, and tracking. 
Under store analytics could be heat mapping, demographic analysis, real-time inventory or stock out, enhancing in-store customer experience, and even getting customer sentiment and analyzing them. Now here we have the key trends shaping the financial services industry. Each of the three large segments of the FSI is driven by different goals. For capital markets, it's providing fast, secure, and resilient systems for trading and investment. For retail banking, it's all about delivering secure, omni-channel customer experiences while optimizing back-end processes. For insurance, it's about engaging customers with personalized experiences while automating processes and adapting to new models. Senior management at these institutions wake up thinking about a host of issues and possibly opportunities that are changing the industry, including evolving regulatory frameworks, cloud transformation, services digitization or providing the ease of service to a more mobile and self-reliant user, robotic process automation, developing scalable solutions to remove manual intervention and streamlining both customer interactions and internal processes, predictive real-time analytics using insights to move from product focus to a customer focus, geospatial IoT, or understanding the insurance risk, risk profile, and mitigate it accordingly, especially as natural disasters become more frequent and intense. Cybersecurity, of course, as banks have massive attack surfaces, experience thousands of attacks every day, and it typically takes weeks or months to determine the threats. One example for use case can be video analytics for the things that I've mentioned. Video analytics can address two problems. First is understanding how physical branch space is used. And second, physical security of the offices. So by leveraging on video analytics solutions to process video and undertake analysis, banks can have a better use of their space or security and now to support health requirements as well due to the pandemic. When it comes to smart cities, the landscape is vast and potential for AI, IoT, and edge computing can be overwhelming. Video surveillance for security, smart traffic, smart parking, smart lighting, location-based context awareness services, smart building coupled with back-to-office solutions to address health protocols are examples. What's important is if you plan to develop application for smart cities is to ensure solutions delivering public value. It requires achieving a balance across five sets of priorities. Number one, assuring high quality of service such as allowing choice and access to services and speed, ease of finding information, integration and information sharing. Second, Ensuring sustainability with a balance of social and economic returns versus pure ROI. Third, inclusion where services are provided for all segments and minimizing the digital divide. Agility and resilience, that's the fourth. Ensuring process simplification, automation, and throughput. And lastly, number five, core services of being connected, secure with privacy, and most importantly, transparency and open communication. Clearly, the move to edge computing is already, already delivering results everywhere. New experiences are being created, operations are being made smarter, and thanks to 5G, more wireless bandwidth is being deployed to make it all happen. Let me share some actual HPE customer results. Racing is my life. Racing is the very essence of who I am. And I'm really happy that HP have come on board. The role of technology has grown and has become crucially important today. And everything is being supported by data. 
95% of Formula One racing and, and the performance side is data-driven. Hewlett Packard Enterprise is a case study how we would like to partner up. We always want to partner with people who are innovating, always wanting to push the envelope, always wanting to discover something new and push the boundaries of technology. So that's why we've partnered with HPE. You are so passionate about our sport that you have embedded two guys within our team that bring us so much more expertise. We're chasing the clock, that's what we do. The biggest challenge in processing data is that we are generating a few hundred channels whilst driving the car. The faster the computers are able to churn that information that's extracted from the car, the faster I can make the alterations in my mind and get out there and do the job. There are multiple different ways of setting up the car, so simulations are very, very key. Usually it takes three days to get the right equation. So HP have come in and brought new technology which has now enabled the engineers to do it within one day. During a regular season, we improve the performance of the car by about two seconds. So you can say that it's about a tense race. To be a multiple world champion, particularly in our sport, it's all about teamwork. There's no point in partnering with people who don't want to be the best because that's why we exist, to be the best. The partnership with Hewlett Packard Enterprise really helps us in our digital transformation. It helps us to take better and faster decisions and eventually be more competitive. As seen in the video, once the Formula One team moved data processing to the track, simulation results from the many sensors on the car could be achieved in less than a day. It's a three-fold improvement from prior effort that took three to four days. With better decision-making came winning results. The Mercedes-AMG Petronas Formula One team delivered real-time analytics enabling seven consecutive wins. Now, let me share with you another customer who is improving the performance and safety of autonomous driving. Technology is all about what it can do for society. We are super focused on making autonomous driving real. Right now, we are in the development phase. We equip cars with 30 plus sensors and a big trunk with a lot of computers. We go out, we test drive this, and we test it and collect data all over the world. And then we simulate the data, it's like 16 terabytes uh, an hour, and then we are running more than 100 petabytes of data just to get the entire system to work. And then you need to scrap continuously, so actually the amount of data that you collect is even greater than that. Validating autonomous driving is really complex, and you need also the customer fleets, so the kind of the Volvo cars out on the streets to test features and finally be able to validate autonomous driving and, and switch it on. And that's where we believe where you can actually train the uh, neural networks out close to the cars, close to the, uh, to the different uh, sites globally. And that's, that's what you need to have that data loop. So we're having research activities in the field of AI. And then if you combine that with the uh, sustainability and the electrical cars, you have this perfect match we know that we will be able to bring autonomous driving out on the streets. So it's a matter of, you know, plus minus a year. It will change how we build cities and how we interact with each other and also what kind of person that could get access to mobility. And that is really exciting. So, Techsmart is a good example of how they're using the intelligent edge to drive new business outcomes. Techsmart is a chemical refiner producing products in everything from ink to boats. Their refining process requires a lot of heat and highly reactive chemicals, so safety is a top priority. They have over 130 pumps and miles of pipes. To keep things humming safely, Trained personnel literally walk through the plant to look, listen, and feel for signs of excessive vibration, noises, or heat. These walkdowns cost the plant 35,000 person hours per year or more than a million dollars in inspection costs. But they were critical given the volatile nature of their business. When edge computing uh, was implemented, 
Tech Smart monitored pump pressure, temperature, and vibrations. With these, potential malfunctions are immediately detected and response team notified before workers or production are endangered. And in case of emergency, insights from geolocation, alarm system, and even weather conditions can help to quickly determine the safest response. They achieved a 50% reduction in planned maintenance cost and increased production uptime. So here's one more example, quality assurance in manufacturing. When HPE builds a server, quality matters. Connectors have to be inserted right and secure. Jumper and switch settings must be spot on. Everything has to be perfect. That is the fundamental challenge of quality assurance. Normally, such QA was performed by human beings. But human beings are prone to not seeing things consistently and in enough detail. By replacing two human eyes with an array of high-resolution cameras and driving pass or fail decisions by AI, we can catch errors in much greater detail. As the finished server rolls by, we instantly capture the production from five different angles. Each camera creates roughly seven megabytes of data. So cameras deliver 35 megabytes of data. This data is then fed into a series of neural networks for pattern recognition, and decision is made whether to pass or fail them. Such AI can be run in a data center or a cloud, but the problem is shipping 35 megabytes of data to a central place for processing takes too long, and we only have a few seconds to determine the quality of the finished product. We found that instead of going from the edge to the cloud, the computation could much easier be done right there and there than in there at the edge. We were able to reduce the time it took to pass or fail the product from 21 seconds to one second. By shaving seconds off the QA process, the assembly line not only increased productivity, it also lowered the number of missed or misdiagnosed failures. So far, um, the stories that you have heard required edge computing to do time-sensitive um, requirements to deliver outcomes. The next HPE customer has medium response time requirement but huge data to analyze. Let's watch this. This planet is a fascinating place. The most fascinating places are usually places that no one has been. I want to bring those places to people so that they can really value them and be here for future generations. I'm on a mission to record the Earth, but to do it very scientifically and to use the most advanced technologies. I listen to everything. I listen to the animals. I listen to glaciers. I listen to the sands and sand dunes. I use that information to really ask questions about what's the status of the planet like right now? This is ecology, this is conservation, this is biodiversity. All the organisms together, but also how they all interact and sustain each other. We have an opportunity in the next 10, 15, 20 years to go and capture these places digitally. Understand these patterns and maybe suggest solutions that might help preserve this diverse, beautiful planet for future generations. We're sometimes hundreds of miles away from the nearest city. So we have to go and get the data, bring it back to the lab, and then we begin to process the data. I wanted to go there as a 19th century kind of explorer with 21st century tools. Technology accelerates the research in a couple of different ways. It allows us to get good quality data in the field. HPE is a good fit. You have the hardware, software, people wear infrastructure that has been tested and deployed in other kinds of applications. We've got about a petabyte of data right now, four million files from over 600 places around the world. We're using very sophisticated AI tools to probe the data. Deep learning algorithms, training data sets. We score the database, we label it, and try to get the computers to learn about what is in the file. We also need to have big servers and big CPUs and GPUs to be able to make these computations, but we also need the big data visualization tools to go along with it. So all the tools, all the infrastructure that has been built out there for a variety of different kinds of 
applications and use cases or just bring them, them right into our particular kinds of studies. Right now we've moved it all to the edge. Dr. Pijanowski's project is just a fascinating project. It's all about sustainability, giving a world that's enjoyable and a place you want to live in. HPE really does want to support things that people care about that are socially relevant. We need to stop and listen, take the earbuds out, and listen to the natural world because this is a marvelous planet. And if you open up your ears, you're just going to be amazed by all the different sounds that exist here. So I hope this session has given you an appreciation of the value of edge computing, especially in a company's digital transformation. When creating a program for a hackathon, first figure out what things that the business could do better. What can be decentralized to the edge? Where can you automate the decision to make it local? Consider the vectors of response time and volume of data processing to see what will create business value. The world is now edge-centric because the edge is where so much data is generated and where instant insight matters the most. Thank you for listening and thank you for participating in this event. I hope to see you in the other HPE sessions. Hello, good morning. My name is Sunil. Today I'm going to present private network 5G. 5G is more than the next generation wireless communication. Over the last four decades, the new G of wireless communication has been released on average every 10, year, 10 years. Since the first generation, each successive release has added new features, new network capabilities to the communication experience, leading to the point where we are today with 4G LTE. Mobile data and the video access to the end users with a significant speed and a low latency for enterprise application. However, as digital transformation advances across industry, Three major technology needs continue to evolve in a market for which the current 4G network capabilities won't be sufficient. The first one will be growth of bandwidth hungry, data heavy, immersive mobile application. At the end of 2024, average data consumption per smartphone is projected to be 21 gigabytes per month. This is up from 5.6 gigabytes in 2018. And the video stream is growing year on year at the rate of 77%. The second is there is an increasing more things becoming connected, generating new data, context and they are exchanging those data in the context across various devices. By 2022, 29 billion devices are expected to be connected worldwide. Emergence of mission critical as to cloud use cases are coming day by day. By 2025, autonomous vehicles will upload more than one terabyte of vehicle and a sensor data per month to the cloud. This is up from 30 gigabytes from the advanced connected cars in 2018. 5G has been envisioned to address these market needs and specifically designed to deliver exponential bandwidth, the capacity for data hungry immersive mobile application to deliver new experiences. Massive data density support to allow connectivity for billions of IoT devices. Ultra reliable low latency from telco core 
all the ways to the edge where the data is generated. In other words, 5G is more than the next release of wireless communication. It is a technology that add exponential capacity in the telecommunication networks for connected more things, more people than ever before. This is opening the door to unimaginable possibilities for enterprise to innovate, find new revenues and extract more value from their data. In yesterday's data-driven world, analytics and insights were limited to traditional business data. The data generated from business processes applications like CRM, ERP, HRM, and supply chain. But as we have all seen, the data landscape has been radically changing over the past few years. 90% of the data available today was created in last two years. And the landscape will continue to change due to fastest growing segment of human data and the machine data. So what is human data? Human data includes all the content what we create, some of which is highly regulated for compliance purposes, like contracts or legal documentation or social media, emails, call logs, and other video, audio, and images what we generate or we create. The machine data, on the other hand, is a complete opposite of human data. It is a high velocity information generated by computers, networks, sensors that are embedded in just about everything. That's what we call Internet of Things. Together, human data and machine data are growing 10 times faster than traditional business data. And organizations that are data-driven are not able to leverage this data to create new value, but they are able to bridge the interconnection of data across the silos and repositories for an integrated intelligence. For example, in retail, the retailer can now maximize the customer loyalties across multiple channels by integrated data from real-time inventory, in-store location positioning, sensors, RFID, and the social media. One of the key trends is emergence of new type of data, which is human and machine. This is driving how organization must transform in order to create or maintain their competitive edge. What is edge data? Over the last three or four years, there is a significant growth that will happen in the data what is created outside the data centers. Today, only the 10% of the data is being created outside the core data centers. As per some of the reports, in coming years, 70% of the data will be generated outside the data center. So what is edge? Edge is where the data is born and distributed, where things are connected and we can make a decision in real time. Right at the time where we live, right at the point where we work and play in any industry, the edge is where the data can be turned into insight in real time. Business are looking at how to capture, analyze, grow new services from the data challenge that lives in harnessing this data and processing while streaming in real time or a near real time for analysis and for the response purposes. The intelligent edge will be an enabler, but at the same time, it would be complementary to 5G. Both enterprise and CSPs are going through their own digital transformation journey. And there is at least one parallel that can be drawn between them. 
they are both building intelligence at their own edges or intelligent edge both of them in order to produce a real time insight they are delivering the digital services and result at the edge on one hand enterprises are becoming data driven connecting iot sensors and devices building up their it infrastructure closer to those devices what we call as enterprise edge that enables them to process and analyze more data faster obtain real time insight furthermore the intelligent edge will be the bridge that brings 5g features into enterprise on other hand csp like globe telecom are also undergoing their own digital transformation first by virtualizing their core data center into a cloud that delivers network function and then by building up it infrastructure where it is closest to the users and the mobile devices we call that one as a telco edge this will enable csp to process the data closer to the users and extend the new 5g features from the core more importantly it will allow them to offer it services to enterprise through this new infrastructure and in a way that is converge with the connectivity their network provide in both digital transformation trend intelligent edge plays a critical role in enabling data processing delivery of digital services applications and a connectivity closer to the user as it relate to 5g been a complementary and enabler to the delivery of a 5g radio into the enterprise world in a traditional it environment the critical innovation at the intelligent edge will allow enterprise to take advantage of 5g features at the same time wifi these intelligent edge will be aided by edge computing capabilities connected by wireless communication protocol that is specifically designed to serve as a connectivity bridge between the enterprise network at indoor environments and the telco 5g networks at outdoor offering performance at the same level or even better than the 5g at a lower cost intelligent edge through edge compute and wireless access enable the convergence of 5g and wifi into two critical aspects the first one is mobility the transition of a mobile device between external telco network and a inter an indoor enterprise network will be seamless and completely transparent to the users and enterprise and the second one would be iot there are different iot protocols which is been followed today bluetooth ethernet zigbee most of these protocol have no 5g capability and they are currently connected to enterprise through the wifi access point now this wifi access point will be a bridge to connect and exchange data into 5g network securely and through existing management platform enterprise will find there is no need to rip and replace their current and planned investment in wireless and edge compute infrastructure rather 5g will become a additional complementary technologies that brings exceptional capabilities to generate unforeseen opportunities for innovation new revenue and efficiency intelligent edge for csp is undergoing a two stage evolution the first one is telco core virtualization into a 5g cloud a fundamental architecture change is happening in their core 
network which consists of access technology, 5G core, and aggregation points. Where they are evolving from a proprietary black box infrastructure to moon IT and a software defined infrastructure in a highly distributed, fully virtualized, heterogeneous cloud. CSP is also adopting the intelligent edge in different way. They are decentralization of data traffic, moving away from core and shifting the data processing and performing network function as close as possible to where the data is generated at the telco edge. This can be only done by adding intelligence to their edge site, meaning edge compute that will enable more efficient use of IT resources, free up the network capacity, and will effectively extend the 5G network function from code all the way to the edge. There would be a coexistence and a collaboration of enterprise LAN Wi-Fi with 5G. It would be critical for the delivery of a 5G feature at indoor enterprise environment, both for mobile device as well as for IoT devices. This integration exists by design. With 5G standard specification, including Wi-Fi 6, supporting some of the protocols in a larger umbrella. Likewise, Wi-Fi 6 is also following some of the protocol defined by 3GPP and IEEE. Embracing the intelligent edge, particularly, particularly as it relates to the convergence of 5G and a Wi-Fi 6 integration would be a great step for CSP to ensure the delivery of 5G into the enterprise environment where there already exists the enterprise network. IDC believe 40% of the data captured at the edge will be processed at the edge. There are at least seven reasons why not all the data need to be sent to the core data center to be processed at the data center, but there is a strong need to process the data at the edge. The first one is latency. What is good in an internet connected car if there is a lag between a child appear in front of a car and when the system actually tells the car to stop? Ideally, there should be no latency at all but usually there is. Even worse, there is a chance that the connection can be lost entirely. For some mission critical functions, latency is intolerable. And you must compute or have an intelligence at the edge. This is true even when the speed increases. When 5G rollout starts, there would be an improvement from the current latency, but still not a fail safe as the edge computing is as of today, but it is going to evolve in coming year. Bandwidth, sending the data from an edge device to the cloud or to the data center can use a tremendous amount of a bandwidth. Fearing that such device will be dragged onto the system, some has proposed creating a separate network for IoT and Edge. This can greatly eliminate the need of sending those data back and forth between the Edge devices and the data center. Most companies as of today cannot simply hand with the bandwidth which is required for tomorrow's Edge. Compliance. There are laws and policies in most of the countries which governs how the regional transfer of the data need to happen. Company that are adopting IoT and Edge need to ensure that they are meeting the local country law and compliance. Security. If 
we are going to send all the data to all over the place there is a very very high chances of data vulnerability and data breaches already hackers have found the way how to breach starting from cards or to the baby monitors which is connected to the internet so we have to ensure that if we put the data at the edge it process at the edge without sending the data all over the places cost extra bandwidth and extra security will going to incur additional cost since companies are often motivated to save cost they can realize the efficiency why iot and edge keeping all the cost down because they are processing the data at the edge duplication if you are going to send all the data to the cloud there would be a lot of duplication some data will be sitting at the edge some data will be sitting at the cloud while it not be reach a 100% deduplication but there would be a same data copy which would be spread across between the edge and the cloud but if you are processing all the data at the edge you are getting rid of duplication of the data data corruption even without any suspicion activity coming from hackers data will be corrupted at its own because of number of uh, retries the drop packet because you are sending a data from edge to the core or there is a misconnection between the edge and the core data center so for mission critical application it is very very important to have no data corruption and this is been possible by doing the edge computing at the edge there would be two different variants of wireless radio communication the first of all will be the public lte or 5g which will be cost effective as the whole spectrum is been shared by the public the latency is almost same for anyone who is using the public lte or public 5g but in case of a incident or a spike we cannot guarantee it because it's a shared spectrum or a shared bandwidth but enterprise need a dedicated radio communication because they have a mission critical application that requires reliability and the mobility it is more suited for a places like a dense cap uh, capacity like a stadium or a autonomous automation site where there's a lot of data which need to be collected and there should be a reliable connection to send those data from the edge to the core and then there can be some remote site which requires a wide area connectivity to support its operation or its function this private network gives them a lower latency and a higher security through local governance simply a private network is where the network infrastructure is used exclusively by device is authorized by end user organization typically this infrastructure is deployed in one or more specific location which is owned or occupied by enterprises devices that are registered on the public mobile network will not work in this private network except where specifically authorized such a private mobile network only serve the devices assigned by the enterprise which means there is no concern about impact of public users on the number of the device that they are going to get connected or the throughput obtained or any other network performance indicators coverage can also be delivered precisely where there is a need whether it's a indoor or whether it's a outdoor such as a port or a mines or a production manufacturing line the functionality of a private network extend beyond capacity and covers area like tailored security measures integration with other operation and a business system belonging to the way, the enterprise recently many businesses are just beginning 
to start their digital transformation journey in addition to their existing pc or smartphone various devices with different communication connection requirements such as robot drones sensors ar vr devices and autonomous vehicles are connected to the private network the edge cloud process data generated by these devices and control the behavior for them these devices requires high mobility wide class reliable communication latency of several millisecond privacy of data generated by the device and stored them on a server traffic isolation that prevents traffic from being mixed up by application and guaranteed of a different quality of experience indicator to the private network private network to cope with this digital transformation there are limitation in a traditional private network to meet this new demand occurring in the enterprise field wired ethernet is very cheap and provides stable communication quality and performance but it cannot provide the mobility because it's wired and wiring construction cost is high and the construction time is long so it is not more suited for a brownfield deployment wifi is easy to deploy and operate but it network cost is low but its communication connection is unstable and its communication distance is short the latency is longer than tens of millisecond and it is vulnerable to security and the mobility is limited for home or general office environment there is no major issue but there is a limit responded to the industrial digital transformation this makes it desperate to introduce a new wireless technology the private 5g network which is recently been spotlighted by digital transformation of enterprise and emerges as the pioneer for the fourth industrial revolution private 5g networks is a enterprise dedicated network that is built using a 3gpp technology rather than using the i triple a technology which are land wired ethernet or wireless wifi this establish a private network in a specific building or a specific site or a campus because 5g is a cellular technology it provides full mobility high reliable wireless and a quality of wired grade strong security by 5g sim and a wide coverage of devices in a enterprise compared to wired ethernet or wifi unlike 4g which mainly target b2c that speed up the smartphone 5g radio provides not only ultra high speed but also low latency of real time services at the same time ultra connectivity to connect huge number of iot devices and sensors beside 5g network provides a network slicing that creates virtual independent networks logically separated through a single physical network for these reasons 5g is ideal for creating multiple dedicated network that is a private network for each application with different communication characteristics for like augmented reality or for uh, like industrial iot application or for each enterprise through a single network private 5g network can quickly and dynamically provide application services customized or optimized for enterprise business using edge computing which provide low latency high reliability communication and high performance services for processing the data near the device also operation automation technologies such as ai and machine based self healing which is recently been applied to 5g network minimize the intervention of private 5g network operators operators for example fault recovery 
or scale out or scale on of the resources significantly reducing the operational burden on it staff of enterprise in addition 5g networks are virtualized and cloud which provide network resources on demand according to the demands of enterprise as in a web scale it service thereby contributing to improving the business agility of enterprise and reducing the network investment as well as operational cost as such private network is a digital enablement infrastructures that combine the cutting edge communication technology whether it's a 5g whether it's a 5g core whether it's a 5g radio whether it's a network slicing within with a cutting edge technologies like a edge computing operation like automation cloud native architecture in the it field and it is emerging as one of the fastest adopting technology by enterprise to embark on a journey of a digital transformation there are many companies who are quickly recognizing the potential afforded by private 5g network also it is going to provide the additional revenue stream by automation and by providing the higher security in a short term enterprise 5g will coexist along with the legacy networking system in fact some companies already use the private lte net the networks and will eventually move to the 5g early adopter for 5g networks will be large seaport airport manufacturing oil and gas rig plant and mostly wide area network enterprises over the next 5 uh, 10 to 15 years 5g will trickle down to private businesses and become a wireless standard for any environment that demand flexibility mobility and reliability in future there will be factories that are completely wirelessly managed and automated through by operations some some markets are allocating dedicated license spectrum to enterprise for the private network for governments opening up a 5g spectrum to enterprise promote industrial growth in a specific geographical area and the enterprise access to the spectrum for, to really promote the competition and to go their industries companies can also build their private network infrastructure to manage their own data and security to avoid industrial security without relying on the network operators let's look at some of the examples of uh, private network the first one will be smart airports for smart airport there would be two different requirement for a wireless communication the first would be the tenants or the passengers and the second would be airport operators the private network aim to provide more efficient more reliable faster connectivity than wifi or public 4g across the airport ground higher capacity of 5g means uh, airport will be able to deploy additional technologies such as uh, mobile safe safety system uh, iot sensors uh, like uh, uh, like a uh, like a uh, like automated vehicles or track and trace technologies this will also free up airport existing wifi networks to deliver a faster and richer connected experience for passengers retail tenants and airport guest airport can be compared to a small city they need great and fast communication since this would be a key to airport success safety and the revenue growth let's look at the second industry 
which will be manufacturing in manufacturing automation is a key to enable the economies of scale that large industrial manufacturers must achieve we are at the onset of the next industrial revolution we call it industry 4.0 this will deliver greater operational efficiency higher flexibility at a lower cost the drive towards industry 4.0 will transform manufacturers through advances in everything from remote mon monitoring to advanced analytics to preventive maintenance and even within the individual site to all these advances rely on connectivity which today tend to use either wifi or a 4g or a fixed cable that are expensive constrained or stationary assets they are difficult to scale to the large number of devices that industry 4.0 will connect the factory floor is often the life critical environment for human especially where the machine and the robots are utilized meaning a communication technology like 5g which aim to wirelessly control such machinery must meet extremely high level of robot robustness and safety control this could include a real time kill switch or other vital safety processes as well as a vigorous cyber security measure to protect the network itself private 5g network can overcome these barriers providing industrial manufacturers a highly reliable ultra fast networks that they control for asset tracking for vision based quality inspection and other use cases mining and the port operations are viewed as a key verticals where 5g is going to have a major impact as it enable the autonomous operation improving the safety and boosting the efficiency through a real time data capture and a real time data analysis private network provides camera as a proof of container conditions as they enter and exit the facilities at the same time the cameras mounted on top of the cranes help in the insurance responsibilities private network connectivity also cover the terminals and the rest of the port area e enabling efficient communication for logistic and asset tracking enhanced connectivity is critical for smarter and a safer underground operation in mining the 5g solution will consist of voice radio communication video broadcasting emergency notification dispatching positioning as well as the autonomous control of mining equipments during the covid 19 pandemic a fast reliable and a secure wireless connection is a lifeline for education sector school colleges universities are facing more and more connectivity challenges while serving their students staff and faculties educators school districts university administrator have had to quickly adopt to e learning and utilize new technologies such as augmented reality digital record keeping high speed campus wide wireless services to keep up with the unprecedented connectivity demands some have even resorted to setting up a costly cellular hotspot devices for their student that's why finding a low cost 
quick and effective wireless connectivity solution is extremely important to educational institutions nowadays. One promising opportunity that they can capitalize on for connecting student and teacher is a private 5G network. Private 5G network offer limitless option for customization so that they can tailor their network deployment to suit their need. With private 5G network, education institutions can offer a better student experience, enhance campus safety, and can reduce operational cost. Not only can these high performance private 5G network can deliver reliable on-campus connectivity for K-12 school or colleges, but they can also bridge the digital divide with off-campus connectivity for a disadvantaged student which are studying from the home. Some of the use case for private 5G network in education will start with a remote building and student. Schools and university can leverage private network to provide high speed wireless services throughout campus, in stadiums, uh, in port venues, in dorms, uh, in, in unconnected buildings and student by placing a private network certified CPE devices in smart classroom. By leveraging private 5G network, school and university can equip their physical campus spaces with better digital capabilities. Student and teacher can utilize augmented and a virtual reality, better video streaming, and a smart boards and podiums to make learning more interactive and productive. Safety and security. Private 5G will provide reliable and secure wireless connectivity for campus security control and monitoring to keep everyone on campus safe. It can be used to build a complete campus security system with campus lights, emergency light, emergency phone, as well as a surveillance security cameras, alarms, alert, smart ID, you know, options are endless. Campus transportation tracking with longer ranges, better roaming and lower lat latency, 5G can seamlessly deliver mobile connectivity to campus vehicles. This will allow students to track their buses when they are arriving, it will enable staff to keep in touch with security car as well as maintenance vehicle. 5G will also help in facilities and building management. Campus staff and administrator can better streamline their operation and can manage the large campus building more efficiently with 5G. By extending their IT visibility and control over utilities and campus assets, infrastructure management can be automated with the real-time monitoring. The last use case or the industry which is going to adopt private network will be healthcare. As hospital look to reemerge from the current challenges posed by COVID-19, many of our healthcare uh, clients tells us that they feel behind the technology curve because they have been focused on what they do the best, care and treatment of the patient. Healthcare system are complex ecosystem that includes hundreds of clinics and thousands of business processes which is executed across many locations. Expanding points of care, digital practice, and a big data call for a new business and an IT model that allows the healthcare system to operate in a real time and support 
more connected more aware and a patient centric approach towards caring private network offer a connected hospital campus of self contained secure and ultra reliable wireless environment that enable iot and a sensor devices not only communicate with each other but also advance and improve the essential employee and a patient experience from a inpatient monitoring and connected drug delivery system to the point of care testing remote appointments or at home care of the high risk patient the iot use case in healthcare are many and pen and pen then uh, covid 19 have really have started the digital transformation journey in the healthcare sector telehealth is on the rise we are also witnessing a shift from reactive care in favor of a preventive medicine in age of a customer or rather patient digital technology is empowering us to become more involved in our own health care the ability to monitor patient outside the medical facilities using the iot healthcare device is also giving practitioner a more complete picture of our well being permitting medical problems or diseases to be detected before the symptoms manifest and like innovations in 5g private cellular network means healthcare can already benefit and can take advantage of 5g by having a 59 uptime reliability connection which is key for a mission critical iot application 5g provide the high resiliency and and the low latency offering the predictable coverage in a complex healthcare setting strong encryption ipsec and the network slices for the maximum security will help the healthcare provider against the patient and the sensitive data a central management platform enabling application scalability with seamless interoperability between public and a private network will be enabled by the 5g network with this one uh, thank you all i hope uh, you like my presentation please drop uh, any questions or clarifications uh, in the specified emails uh, like in case of uh, like any queries thank you thank you very much Good day, everyone. Welcome to HPE session on cloud adoption will evolve. Let me start by introducing Hewlett Packard Enterprise, who we are, and how have we been helping our enterprise customer accelerate their digital transformation uh, through hybrid cloud. So we have been in the business of uh, supplying IT to our enterprise customers for many years, uh, and uh, since 2010, we've been active in helping enterprise transform. their IT environment to uh, set up private clouds and uh, all the projects that we have done we have proven methodologies software and IP that we have documented and fine tune over the years and these are the IPs that we use to help our customer uh, springboard and accelerate their cloud transformations it has also been tested and uh, and uh, referenced uh, together and mapped to our cloud providers and key ecosystem players technologies uh, so that uh, it can be easily mapped and they can easily develop uh, the private cloud based on the cu the customer's technology of choice uh, collectively we have in, in, in implemented over a thousand plus enterprise engagements uh, for private cloud projects uh, over vmware openstack aws azure and google cloud platform right in fact uh, public cloud as well and into multi clouds and we started our journey into multi cloud uh, in the year of uh, 2017 when we've acquired ctp and red pixie 
who are born in the cloud companies they are born in the cloud and have been uh, in the business of helping enterprise customers uh, migrate to the public cloud uh, they among their successes are 50 plus fortune 500 uh, cloud transformation clients eight of which are from the top 15 u.s banks right with the uh, combined skill sets that we have brought in uh, with uh, CTP, Red Pixie, and our existing uh, cloud uh, consulting uh, personnel, we form a group of what we call HPE Poinix Services. I myself, uh, I'm from the APEC uh, Poinix Advisory Team. Uh, a bit of background about myself, I started my career uh, in HPE as a program, uh, sorry, before HPE, in a customer environment as a programmer, a database administrator, uh, and an operation lead. In fact, my uh, last project that I did with the customer uh, was to help them modernize their uh, financial system from the mainframe to a distributed client server systems. And that project has um, uh, propelled me and, and uh, to launch uh, my career next with HPE in helping our enterprise customer with their data center transformation. Uh, we've mo I've modernized together uh, with this client uh, from uh, mainframe centralized system to distributed client server system to uh, implementing their technology on virtualization software to automation, introducing automation into the data center, right? And um, and and by by the year uh, 2000 and 2010, uh, the, the buzz is all about cloud computing. Uh, AWS was born in the year 2000 and introduced the concept of uh, cloud computing uh, to, to, to automate and deliver IT as a service uh, from the, the additional capacity that they have in their data center. And with that, uh, I also embarked on the same journey with the Malaysia Telco. Uh, we've helped them to develop, design and develop their first uh, Telco private cloud that was offered commercially to their uh, customers as well. Uh, and then we went, I went on to bid uh, uh, for the uh, HPE bid for the uh, together we are partner bid for the Singapore government first private cloud in 2012 and we were awarded the project and I was the uh, uh, CTO and the uh, enterprise architect to uh, 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 to ensure that uh, the whole project was uh, delivered successfully and uh, and thank you for your patience for listening uh, to my career and why am I uh, talking about my career because I want to share with you. That's exactly what I went through uh, over the years. I started uh, in the traditional IT, right, which are dedicated physical homogeneous uh, platform. And then I start uh, uh, my going designing uh, IT as a service uh, to deliver as a service as a private cloud. And then after that, uh, together with my uh, public cloud colleagues, we talk about multi-cloud and hybrid cloud. How do we uh, help customers to be able to consume from the different cloud, right? But yet, when they consume or when they develop the cloud, the cloud still exists as silos. Where each cloud have their own architectures, they have their own security design, uh, and they have their own uh, way of being managed. Their service level are different in each of this uh, deployment model. So where is it all heading tomorrow? Today, when I talk to my customer, every customer and every businesses wants the ability to be able to consume a cloud and all their uh, different deployment models, be it traditional, private, managed, or public. And reality is that the reason for that is because uh, there is benefit to running your workload in a private cloud and also running your workload in the public cloud. Where in the public cloud, it may be a, 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 a cheaper startup, but when you add the service level inside and you add the bandwidth inside and you add all the other services inside, it may not necessarily end up being cheaper than the private cloud if let's say the customer consumption pattern is consistent and also if some of the data are sensitive they cannot run it in public cloud they have to run it in their own uh, uh, managed environment or in their own private cloud therefore at the end of the day cloud adoption it's about hybrid cloud and multi-cloud how do i help the uh, application or other the business to be able to consume IT across the different deployment model. The services they are uh, implemented has to be interoperable between the cloud and uh, it needs to be managed. There needs to be a, a governance in place. Uh, whether the workload is deployed in private cloud or in public cloud, the security policy policies and security posture needs to be upkeep to ensure that the system is not hacked because when we interoperate between private public right you want to make sure that the public do not expose your private 
right? You need to make sure that security policies are in place, whether the users are using the uh, the application in in when they are in the private cloud, they assume the private cloud security policy uh, posture, and when they run in the public cloud, uh, it's able to access services that are in the internet, and they are also uh, internally, right? The security policies needs to be mapped to the user and the application. Uh, rather than uh, just the environment that where they go, uh, it adopts a different security posture because the environment, uh, um, uh, they have a different security when they go there, but it's mapped to their role, right? So at the end of the day, the whole environment, uh, the, the application and business wants a hybrid IT delivery model. They want the ability to develop once and run anywhere. And they want that they are able to migrate their workload from private cloud to public cloud, right? So the whole um, development environment for the application has to be open standard based. Uh, it, it, you know, to container technology is one technology that enables uh, uh, the, the application to be developed once and run anywhere. And the platform must support open standards. Yeah. So where is it heading tomorrow? Is it just hybrid multi-cloud? No. The cloud adoption is evolving, yes. The new kit on the block is the age, and that's why we are here today, right? So uh, IDC predicts that by 2022, which is next year, there will be 55 billion devices that will be connected worldwide. And 50% of the data that is created will be at the edge. They will be created and processed at the edge outside the, the walls of the data center, outside the, the traditional data center or the cloud, outside the four walls. And that's the, uh, the, 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 the evolution, right? With 5G and Wi-Fi 6 and LTE and smart devices, right? more can now be done at the edge. And this is going to drive the next level of transformation, the next level of cloud adoption, which is at the edge. So what has changed and what has not? Technology that powers the cloud computing. It started with just virtualization and automation. Then it moves on to open standard software. We can do a software defined uh, uh, virtual lens. We can do software defined compute, software defined storage. Uh, we could even do a software defined wide area network today. Right, so cloud connectivity has changed. Uh, we can now define security policies that secures from the edge all the way to the core. Right. In the terms of the location of cloud with edge cloud, now it could be anywhere. It could be in the construction site, it could be in the manufacturing factory, it could be in the uh, uh, retail malls. Uh, it's not just in the data center. And Telco, Telco is setting up their own edge cloud and developing new services for, uh, appli for, applica for application developers such as you to use to enable more edge computing projects to be born and more edge computing use cases to be defined with edge coming into the equation and edge cloud coming to the equa equation, right? Uh, there are more cloud use cases because now, just like the mainframe and the client server, cloud computing is get going out of the data center. It's now going to the edge and some of the processing can happen at the edge itself. So, but what has not changed? Well, the multi-cloud continues to be there. Public cloud continues to be there. They now offer services that helps you define cloud projects for the edge. It also uh, gives you services that define uh, uh, cloud uh, services to run in the public cloud itself, right? The, diff the main key difference between the public cloud and running at the edge is that the public cloud services runs in the public cloud uh, and, uh, and even the public cloud are uh, uh, deploying uh, assets that can run at the edge as well. Right. So, uh, but this has not changed though. The public cloud will still be there. Managed cloud will still be there. Private cloud will still be there. Traditional IT will still be there. And the journey to adopt cloud does not change. It is a journey. It is not an endpoint. Um, the people, uh, the enterprises who have started their cloud transformation journey 10 years ago is still on that journey. And that journey will not end because more use cases will continue to come out. And uh, applications uh, will run in any cloud that they wish according to uh, the, the business requirement uh, where it is needs to be accessed and also uh, whether uh, it is able to, uh, in the cost of deploying and uh, and also the data security and data sovereignty requirements right so workload will run where it needs to run depending on 
the business requirement and the security requirement and the cost to deliver the service. So when you ask all this for the enterprise, right? where do I all start? Do I start building the H Club first or do I start uh, developing my core applications on the public cloud first or on the private cloud for that matter? Well, Simon Snack says that we are all must start with the question why. Let's start with why. Why are we embarking on the H Cloud project? Why are we embarking on the H computing project? Is it that we can improve uh, real-time local decision making and as a result uh, enable uh, 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 more revenue streams? Uh, is it that through it we can bring a uh, uh, new market or deploy new product to the to the floor uh, as quickly as possible new programming to the floor uh, com uh, to, as quickly as possible so that uh, we are able to, the the age can have autonomous operations decisions that they can make right and hence uh, maybe save costs to the supply chain distribution because uh, if things are going to uh, there's, there's an issue they can they can alert and send uh, the production to another uh, location to start the production line right it can also improve the operations uh, and increase uh, return on investment why because if you if the age can report back that there are multiple failures or there are a few uh, items that has been uh, detected to be uh, having fault right it can send for maintenance engineer or it can send for corrective action, right? And it can alert if there is a potential problem coming so that it do not cause a disturbance to the manufacturing um, uh, supply chain because for them, the uh, inventory at the floor, it's really just in time. And a breakdown in the machine will cause a major disruption to the end-to-end -end supply chain for the manufacturing industry. It can also ensure security and compliance in the in the in the government, right? With the uh, surveillance, uh, lampo surveillance for that matter, example, right? It's able to uh, maybe deter uh, some crime from happening because they know they are being observed, or help the police uh, catch uh, uh, criminals quicker uh, to piece the information together to be able to to track uh, what's going on, right? So it could also help with ensuring security uh, and also. Uh, when data are being captured because of age computing, right, they can ensure that data are clean before it's sent in, therefore ensuring higher security at the back end. And because now computing are distributed to the age, uh, it is the able to application is able to scale out quickly for larger operations because it does not need to send everything back to the HQ where resources are. Uh, expensive and also limited right uh, to process because they can uh, clean up and uh, filter the the necessary uh, 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 intelligence that it gets and send that intelligence back to HQ for processing next what what is the the intelligent age ecosystem what are the sensors and edge devices that needs to be connected to collect the data? Understanding the business outcome you want, what are the where are the sensors? What are the sensors required to collect those data? And then the data after it's collected, right? How is it gonna be analyzed? How are you gonna act upon those information? It needs to be sent back to the HQ. It needs to connect to the HQ on the right spectrum. Uh, the data needs to be sent back so that decisions can be made and they, uh, and and the decision made can be uh, passed back down the chain to the end of the uh, edge, right, to take action. And the whole ecosystem needs to be protected. Any breakage in the ecosystem will cause uh, uh, vulnerabilities to be exposed and, uh, and as a result, uh, there could be exposure and risk uh, that uh, would not be, um, that, that need to be mitigated. So when we look at when we talk about edge computing and edge cloud, we do really need to look at end to end from the point it connects to the point it delivers the information and back in how we protect the whole ecosystem. We also need to uh, understand and address what piece of analysis or data needs to be done at the edge. This is usually uh, data that if you were to transfer back to HQ due to the latency of the network, uh, it may cause um, some data to not be able to go through and cause the application to fail. 
This is a perfect use case where edge computing and edge cloud makes a significant difference because now data can be captured at the edge, analyzed, and based on the analysis that they do uh, and the output, right, it can send that analysis and the to back to HQ, right, uh, to tell let them know that this is happening and this is the action that I'm going to do. And now HQ has just had to respond and acknowledge and synchronize the status so that they are in sync. What this does is that it allows the decision making to be taken at the edge, and this is a key breakthrough uh, in 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 business. Um, uh, processing because now decision can be done at the edge and it can be synchronized and the turnaround time uh, is a lot more faster. At the same time, when we talk about edge computing and edge cloud, right, we do need to look at uh, and consider the industry by which uh, the use case will be mapped into. Each industry have their own uh, uh, applications and 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 and, and uh, systems that are available today that the edge uh, use cases can be connected into or deliver value into, right? Uh, for example, in, in retail, right? There is the online automated store, the shopping cart, uh, the edge the solutions, how does it tie in from the warehouses to the online carts, to the consumer, to the smart devices, right? There are many use cases where uh, edge uh, processing can uh, uh, create a value differentiator. Example, uh, in retail, uh, when when there is a, a overwhelming supply or rather uh, of a certain product in the warehouse, and as a result, if it's not used, it could be past its expiry, causing a loss to the company. And what they can do is, uh, the warehouse side can report that there is a surplus in stocks and update the systems, and the systems uh, can inform uh, the malls all right, and go to the shelf, all the malls, the shelf, that particular product item, they can reduce the price and uh, have, a, have a fire sale right, of that product uh, so that it creates a demand to clear the stocks uh, and, and, and they can send out the warehouse to prevent uh, a possible loss of, uh, of, uh, of uh, product because you know, it is just expired because it was, uh, the demand was not there. Right? So this will help the customer to increase the demand and therefore uh, uh, you know, uh, help the turnaround of the stocks and, and keep the company healthy, right? So that's one uh, example of a use case. But ultimately, in each of these industry, uh, the applications, there is a common architecture and the systems and tools that they use. It is important that when you are designing your edge computing and your edge cloud, consider the target market space, which industry uh, use cases are you addressing? And when you consider those industry, consider uh, what are the uh, architecture that they have and how you plug yourself into it and therefore what connectivity you need to have back to HQ to these systems that are running in the HQ, right, uh, in their warehouse. So let me quickly show an example of what I mean by that. Let's take another example, smart manufacturing. How would we change uh, the recipe for each success here? In manufacturing, catching a defect is a big business. Applying modern AI-driven technology like computer uh, vision is quickly becoming the way to deliver quality assurance. The more the cameras catch, the more money can be saved by avoiding costly quality issues. We need an intelligent edge computing and uh, for the quality assurance solution. Let's further say a uh, customer in this example considers it impractical to wire all their manufacturing floors because they have 500 sites worldwide. Uh, to a wired internet. Instead, in considering the connection, he uh, opts for a ruggedized wireless access point and a software-defined wide area network solution from Aruba that will wire the uh, wirelessly connects the applications uh, to the end users uh, through the SD appliance that is deployed uh, to the edge sites. Right? Uh, as we are talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning to perform analytics, for these camera feeds that comes in real time. Uh, we may need GPUs, right? That needs to be fitted into the server, right? And, uh, and uh, into this EL4000 server. This means, uh, uh, based on the real world requirement, maybe it may need a 20H line uh, 4000 servers with, uh, uh, with uh, two GPU cards uh, running across the 500 factories worldwide, right? And, and, and that will generate a lot of data. The video feeds will come in. Let's assume that the manufacturer does not uh, 
uh, work with VMs, but instead they have shifted to open standard and they're using a container strategy. In that case, we would then explore uh, HPE Esmeral uh, as a potential fit for the container management platform. Esmeral as a data fabric uh, that will allow data to be uh, to be stored, to be managed, and also to be analyzed. Right? And Esmeral uh, is a perfect platform to 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 connect uh, to collect the data from all the uh, 500 sites, right? Uh, to locate into the uh, the Esmeral data fabric, and then uh, machine learning and algorithm can be applied to it to uh, deliver the analysis and uh, highlight that there may be potentially some uh, quality assurance issue. So again, we can see HPE technology being uh, applied and our partners technology being applied across to deliver an edge cloud solution, an edge computing solution end to end. Ultimately, the reason for the technology uh, is actually a business outcome conversation. And that business outcome conversation was about improving operations on the floor to detect a uh, possible fault, right? Uh, to to, to uh, rectify ASAP so as not to affect their supply chain end to end. So the solution detail conversation is the conversation that we can have with you to help you map up the business outcome that you want to achieve with your each computing uh, uh, project. So how do we embark on this each computing project, right? And um, step one is really to understand where the workloads map to and where it needs to be placed. I I think I have uh, covered many times about the data source. Right, a data source could be a sensors and actuators, a cameras. Right, it could be a sensors that's sitting in the in the machine, right? That that is available today uh, through the manufacturing line, uh, and that data source needs to be uh, collected and stored. And you need an edge compute to collect the data, uh, do some aggregation of the data, right? A cleansing of the data, and maybe do some early analytics if necessary, right? And the data that is collected is then sent back to the manufacturing plant, edge cloud, right? Where they are able to. Uh, could consolidate and collate uh, uh, all the uh, uh, information, right? Uh, to bundle and to send back, and they are the one who wired, right? And send back to the data center, uh, to the HQ, uh, and pro processing. So this is what we mean by an edge to cloud. This is our HPE blueprint for IoT applications uh, that is all mapped all the way from the data source uh, to the HQ, edge to cloud as a service. Right. So the step number one is to map your solution requirement, your business solution, right, in terms of what you require, what workload. Remember, I talk about what workloads need to be processed at the edge to this various uh uh, uh whether it's to an edge compute an edge cloud, based on your requirement on what needs to run where. That's where we start designing what services you require in order to deliver an end-to-end -end edge to cloud services. Step two, when you are building your environment, consider using an agile approach. Do not try to build the entire environment. Start with maybe a single node. Build up based on the workload required that you mapped just now. Start with uh, the maybe an innovation zone, right? And develop the uh, proof of uh, proof of concept or proof of value of what you are doing, right? And 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 get that get that foundational services start up and then uh, set up and tested, right? And when uh, you're happy with the, 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 the environment, you create the next environment called development and test. You develop the environment, right? You develop your code and you test your code. And when your code is tested and uh, passed the UAT, it is then moved to what we call the production environment. And this environment exists in parallel at all times because the concept of MVC Minimum Viable Cloud is that you start with a uh, a, a small, uh, rather a, a basic environment to meet the basic needs, and then uh, the foundational services we call it, and then we develop further to operationalize it, to mature it, uh, to be able to handle uh, security, uh, and then the governance, and also to uh, move down the CI/CD uh, uh, development chain, right? So that you can continuously develop, integrate, and migrate to production while production is still running. So the three environment, one setup stays, but what happens is that you uh, start um, uh, pushing your code out every time it's tested, right? And, and the environment grows. So you can see now your edge cloud and even your core 
will grow and scale as your application mature yeah so minimum viable cloud starts small develop what is necessary but consider the environment to not just develop one environment but we develop all the three environment and we mature the environment up uh, to scale out uh, when the uh, additional workloads come in so a minimum viable cloud uh, addresses uh, three dimensions the workload that is required that go in set up the environments the target environment raise the services up to become production uh, level and then the cycle starts again with the next function next feature and the next function next feature until you get to where you are step three okay you have built your 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 starting point you have tested it right and uh, you've grown uh, maybe tested it in a single geography and now you want to make it to become big scale because age is all the, 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 the return you get from your age project is really when you have uh, multiple deployments and that's where uh, you can leverage the whole concept of cloud computing is to leverage on the economy of scale so you then need to think about how do I manufacture what I have to become multi-tenant multi-geography and uh, and across uh, uh, multiple age uh, nodes right how do I ensure that uh, I can use the same uh, application for multiple tenants right so you then need to develop a scalable approach from your MVC how do I scale out and scale uh, even into multiple nodes right so repeat step one uh, is to define and map out your workloads what are the uh, where your workloads needs to reside and run on step two is to determine what your innovation zone will look like right set up your development and test mature it to become production and then start again at the next uh, next function or feature that you need to roll out and step three is to take that code and to grow beyond one geography how do I multiply it uh, to become to have a global manufacturing architecture from edge to cloud and that's really working with partners uh, such as uh, ourselves and our sponsors right at the end of the day when we talk about edge computing edge cloud and cloud adoption evolution we are looking at a rich a shared a shared rich intelligent edge ecosystem the edge computing does not reside does not it's not just one piece of code uh, it's code sitting in different clouds right and uh, it needs to be connected uh, and uh, it needs to be able to be delivered as a service right remember I talk about multi multi hybrid cloud customers are our customers are enterprise customers wants to consume our IT as a service in the same way when you roll your edge computing project they want to consume as a service as well once you prove uh, once you have passed the development of the functionality when you talk about a scale up global architecture it, we want to partner together with you and, uh, and and deliver your solution and software as a service right and today we offer infrastructure and platform together with Intel a partner right but tomorrow there are many more services that we can build together so as a start uh, let's hear from uh, my, my CEO Antonio Neri to how HPE, what is HPE's vision uh, with regards to uh, delivering everything as a service. It wasn't long ago that catching a ride like this or accessing every single song in the world like this or even connecting to your home like this Hello. seemed unimaginable. Kind of like having the cloud experience outside the public cloud. But that experience is here, across all your apps and data, wherever they live, as a service. We were the first to say the world will be hybrid. And it is. Just as streaming brought the theater to you, and online shopping brought the entire store to you, HPE is bringing the entire cloud experience to you. Cloud is not a destination, it is an experience. Apps and data unified. Clouds, edges, data centers, unified. This is more agility, instant insights, faster innovation, data gravity defied. All in one place, one single line of sight, one consistent experience. One direct route to a better next and the vision to take you further. This is the cloud experience everywhere. This is HPE. 
cloud experience everywhere. You heard my CEO talk about it. And how do we offer you as HPE GreenLink? HPE GreenLink is our uh, our vision that to bring the cloud experience to you, whether it's at the edge, at the data centers, and or at the cloud. Today, our technology uh, are available to our partners uh, to uh, as a service, as a self service from us from the self service portal, a point and click, and we will deliver the IT on prem for them to use. And it is available on a pay per use. We have additional. Uh, capacity uh, in place to allow the infrastructure or the, uh, or the services to scale up or scale down and we also provide the managed services for this service that when we offer it to you uh, we can help with uh, helping you keep track of the cost that's being spent whether it's with us or with the public cloud we can also help you uh, uh, um, monitor the security compliance uh, to some of the standards that your business, your your customers may have the PCI standards, the HIPAA standards, the CSA standards, and report back to you as a consumer uh, whether your uh, server has been uh, is compliant with the uh, these standards that has been set out there uh, that you may need to comply to. Green Lake Cloud Services today we offer you infrastructure and platform as a service. Uh, but in our menu, we can actually offer a lot more. We have solutions ready to deliver VDI as a service, SAP HANA as a service, uh, machine learning ML ops as a service. We also can provide backup as a service. Uh, we can uh, provide you the data fabric, as I mentioned, uh, and a database as a service. Uh, we could uh, provide networking as a service together with Aruba, and we can even provide you bare metal as a service, should you require to have a server uh, that you can fully use and deploy when your business requires it. We can offer you bare metal as a service and storage as a service. So there's so much more on the other possibilities what GreenLake Cloud Services can um, can help you fulfill your vision and your edge computing uh, ideas to become a reality. You do not need to build everything from scratch. At the end of the day, cloud adoption is evolving into an ecosystem of partners. We work together to deliver an end-to-end H to cloud services uh, to your end customer and to our end customer. A cloud is gelling uh, the partners together because at the end of the day, uh, it, it takes many to, to create the end to end uh, together with the telco, together with uh, to provide the H connectivity to gel the pieces together to deliver it as a service uh, uh, independent of the locations of uh, where the cloud is, is residing. And that's all I have for you today about cloud adoption will evolve. It will evolve from the uh, the cloud computing data centers that we are so familiar with, the hyperscalers public cloud that we are so familiar with, to the edge uh, cloud, to the edge compute at the at your at the uh, enterprise customers uh, uh, factory or construction site, as I said earlier. So thank you for your patience. I uh, appreciate your time, uh, and I hope that uh, I uh, I have. Um, um, uh, been able to uh, share uh, to with you my experience that cloud will continue to evolve. Uh, it is the platform for uh, ideas to be born uh, and also for uh, uh, a better um, uh, business uh, uh, in the future on what we are what we can expect to achieve through cloud. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Hector. I work as a solutions architect for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And today I'd like to share with you uh, something really interesting about the edge. It's called MEC, a uh, key to unlocking 5G promises. So MEC actually stands for multi-axis edge computing. It's an exciting new technology from HPE that focuses on how we can leverage the edge to bring more um, benefits to our businesses nowadays. So let me start off with a short outline of the topics that would be covered. First is an introduction to edge computing. Second would be uh, multi-access edge computing. Uh, what really is it? Uh, how it, does it differ from other uh, edge computing um, solutions out there in the market today? And uh, some use cases, some very exciting use cases and scenarios that are that leverage 
a great deal on MEC so that we can move forward with our digital transformations. All right? So let me first start by defining or introducing you guys to what is edge computing. So to understand edge computing properly, we really have to understand first, where is this edge that we keep on talking about? So imagine when you uh, take a photo from your mobile phone, um, it is a new piece of data, right? It's a new piece of data, that photo, a new piece of data that you've captured, you've generated using your mobile phone. So imagine the millions, actually billions of photos being taken every day on the billions of mobile phones around the world, right? So there is a fundamental shift in data generation nowadays because right now, instead of data being generated within the enterprise or within an organization, it's generated outside. It's generated at the edge. So this is fundamentally where the edge resides. Wherever data is generated nowadays, it's outside the, tradi uh, the traditional enterprise location. It's outside the head office, outside the data center, and definitely outside of your public cloud, right? So everything that uh, generates data is now called things, okay? So things is anything that generates large amounts of data, your mobile phone, uh, the sensors or uh, the sensors in a factory floor, um, the GPS on the GPS device on a connected car. So those things, uh, the, the most basic one is the, the laptop that we keep on using. Those things generate data, mostly by our help. Uh, they generate data and that is done in the edge, okay? So data basically goes through two initial stages. First, it is sensed, meaning the moment you take that photo, it's sensed by your phone. The readings, uh, the readings acquired by a sensor on a factory floor or machinery on a, on a factory floor that is sensing of data. Um, and then afterwards, the data is aggregated. Why does it make sense for us to keep data or aggregate data? So aggregation basically combines multiple streams of data together. Why uh, it's very important is because the value derived from the data increases when we actually correlate them, okay? When you're able to correlate one piece of data from a, to another, and then you get actionable information from that, that is how you unlock the value of data. And then there, there's a stage three and four, which is actually traditionally done in a centralized location, a data center or a cloud, wherein there's early analytics, early decision-making, early processing, using that data. And then there's deep analytics. These are the types of processing and um, such as AI, uh, the crawl of AI. Lear AI, when it learns, it uses deep processing or deep analytics, right? Now, traditionally, this has, uh, as I've mentioned, the uh, stages three and four, they're basically done within the data center, a centralized location, or cloud, but now with the sheer amount of data that's being driven or being generated at the edge, it makes sense nowadays to actually move the processing from a centralized location to the edge itself. Okay, so that's the premise of edge computing. Okay, later on, I'll discuss more about that. So a couple of terms that I'd like you to get a grasp with. So basically IoT, it's called Internet of Things. As I've mentioned earlier, things here uh, pertains to anything that produces data, okay? Massive amounts of data. IoT is basically 
an intersection of information technology and OT, operations technology. So the machineries on the factory floor that I mentioned earlier, those are that's an example of OT. And then the network that data flows through, that's an example of IT. So whenever you merge these technologies together, you, you are able to effectively gather data. And that typically, that IoT use case typically happens or always happens at the edge. So again, it's very important to note that the edge is different or actually quite the opposite of cloud and data center because cloud and data center tends to be centralized. So uh, you have to transport data far distances to get to the data center or the cloud. But with the massive amounts of data being generated, it actually makes sense to distribute the processing of it, the, the processing of the data, the computing at the edge. Okay. So just how much, just how much does this data amount to? So let me give you a brief example. In 2020, there were 1 billion installed security cameras worldwide, right? It actually translates to 30 billion frames per day. 30 billion frames per day. So that's a massive amount of data. And none of these were generated in the data center or maybe a few or generated in the cloud. Maybe the security cameras in the data center generate some sort of video data. But a lot of this is all, almost all of this, uh, these video cameras are installed where? At the edge, at the edge, on the cell sites, on the, at the schools, at the building facilities, bank, uh, bank branches, ATM machines. These are the locations where these cameras are actually uh, installed, all right? So let's um, take it closer to home. Let's make the, the, the numbers more um, well, graspable, or, uh, something we can grasp, okay? So a small retail shop, your typical 7-Eleven, let me just bring up my pointer. A typical retail, uh, retail store like your 7-Eleven or your mini stop. For example, we've installed around 10 cameras. So 10 cameras will produce in 30 days 13 terabytes worth of data. That's 13 hard disks, right? External hard drives. And to transport that data effectively, you'll have to have a consistent dedicated bandwidth pipe of 82 Mbps, okay? It, it, it requires a lot from your network, but this is just one retail store, right? Imagine a grocery store, a large retail store with 60 camera, cameras, okay? In 30 days, it generates 79 terabytes of data already. And if you want to transport that 79 terabytes of data to your cloud or to your central location or data center, you're going to have to provision a network that can shell out 490 Mbps dedicated to that particular retail store only. Okay, imagine if you have to pay for this much internet connection, right? It's quite a lot. So imagine if you have a warehouse. You're a big manufacturing company. You have to have a warehouse. Right? I mean, numerous warehouse, for example. It has approximately 250 cameras. It will, in 30 days, um, produce 330 terabytes of raw video data, okay? To transport that reliably, you'll need a pipe of 200 gigabits per second, uh, sorry, two gigabits per second, okay? so. If imagine if you need to tell your bosses or your, the, the company, how can you justify having two, gig, uh, two GBPS of internet dedicated just for video in your warehouse, right? The, the cost of this would not make sense from an investment standpoint. So that is why 
there is a shift, it makes sense to shift the processing of that data, this particular type of data, video data, it makes sense to shift its processing from the head office to the actual warehouse, to the actual retail store, all right? So that's why there's a shift to the left and compute is being brought to the edge. Why? Because it saves on a lot of things, okay? Number one, it saves a lot of latency, okay? The rule in networking, right, is the longer or the farther you have to go, the, the farther you have to transport traffic, the longer it takes for that data to get there, right? So latency plays a big role, especially if you need real-time, uh, if you have real-time applications that you are deploying at the edge. For example, being a gamer myself, latency matters a lot to me. Anything above 100 milliseconds, it really affects my experience with that video game, right? Re regardless if I'm playing on my laptop or I'm playing on my mobile phone, I want good latency. So rather than invest on all the caching, all the bandwidth pipe, paying all the telcos, it makes sense to actually for a gaming company that used to have its server located in Singapore to have a server, a gaming server within Metro Manila, right? Because it will cut the latency to 10% of what it usually is, right? So all the gamers in Metro, at Metro Manila will benefit from that low latency. So that's just one benefit, okay? The second and the third benefit go hand in hand. You save on bandwidth and therefore you save on cost because bandwidth costs money. So the more you save bandwidth, the more you save on cost. It's pretty straightforward. The fourth one is actually mitigating the risks of security breaches, right? Because the longer you transport traffic uh, data, the longer it's in transit, the more likely or the, the more likely that it gets intercepted or sniffed along the way, right? So it actually makes sense to keep the data um, within its within the edge and just secure that edge facility, secure that edge um, platform wherein you're processing data on. And you don't have to invest that much on the bandwidth and on the security of the traffic uh, or of the pipe or the internet connectivity going to your data center or cloud, right? More on this later. You also do not need to invest that much on the duplication anymore because the data stays where it is being produced or being uh, gathered. So you don't have to they duplicate a lot to save on, well, the second and the third item, bandwidth and cost, because the duplication is closely tied to saving bandwidth and cost as well, okay? And the less chances of corruption as well. Data, when you transfer it multiple times from device to device, there's a chance for, of it being corrupted. And data loss is one of the most um, destructive things to a company's bottom line, right? Whenever you lose data, you lose money, okay? So if it's through corruption, that's easily avoidable using edge computing. And lastly, there's a matter of compliance. If you're a financial institution or if you're a government institution that has to transport its data to the cloud, to the public cloud, we all know that there's no public cloud provider with a facility here yet. Uh, in the Philippines. So with that, um, transporting your data out of the country may, uh, may subject you to some compliance, additional compliance uh, processes, right? Of compliance metrics. So these are the things that you save on uh, when you actually shift your computing at the edge, okay? So now that, now that we've clearly defined what the edge is and why it makes sense 
to compute or shift computing or data processing at the edge. Let me walk you through some characteristics of what the edge will be moving forward. Okay, the edge will be connected. Definitely, the edge will have to be or has always been connected to the rest of the organization or to the rest of the infrastructure, but more so with uh, moving forward. Okay, the the thing that needs to uh, that you need to understand here is for the edge has multiple connections or multiple access uh, paths to it. So the edge obviously has Wi-Fi. That's the most familiar one. Another familiar one is cellular. Now we're, we have 5G. And also there's Bluetooth and Ethernet, right? But also there are legacy ones, um, connectivities or access channels that have been invented way before Bluetooth. Um, like SCADAs and CANs, right? So it's very important since the edge will be connected multiple ways, it's very important to support all these connectivities, right? At HPE, we have a lot of solutions to support these connectivities. So we have Aruba Wi-Fi and SB1. Of course, for the wide connectivity, we have Aruba switching. And of course, we have multi-access edge computing it's in the name, right? Multi-access, meaning it supports multiple ways of accessing data, all right? So one of these is actually edge line systems and our OT link. It actually allows you to connect directly to the sources of data that are more legacy or more traditional like SCADAs, right? So it allows you to gather data from those as well and to process them effectively at the edge. So one key of, a, of, of an e of a proper edge computing platform is that you are able to support multiple types of connections. All right, that's one characteristic of the edge. Next, the edge will be distributed. So distributed here could mean a lot of things. Okay? It's di distributed in terms of users, right? It's distributed across, uh, across multiple um, areas of the business. So we have the end user, we have the line of business, we have IT, and we have security as well, right? Also, it's distributed across multiple platforms. It has to be able to be supported on multiple platforms, this edge computing. So MEC, or uh, multi-access edge computing, what we have in HPE, can actually be supported on multiple platforms like Aruba Wi-Fi, are, uh, of course, the switches, SD1, edge line systems. Edge line system, uh, systems is great whenever you have um, environmentally challenging in, um, use cases, right? If you have an oil rig or a factory floor that you need to process data on, um, edge line system, systems are ruggedized form factors. So you uh, have ruggedized form factors, so you can actually... Uh, processor data, even if temperatures, humidity is not ideal for normal devices. But if you are able to control the environment somewhat, the environment, uh, you can do edge hyperconverge. Edge hyperconverge, the difference from edge hyperconverge and normal hyperconverge solutions is that edge hyperconverge tends to be denser. So if you have uh, if you need smaller form factors for those tight spaces with at the edge, you can go with edge hyperconverged because it saves a lot in terms of form factor. So you also have your uh, leg, uh, your traditional uh, nimble storage arrays and three bar storage arrays. And of course you have your server platforms. So these should all be integrating together, right? Uh, integrating properly with one another so that you can have a unified an edge computing platform. Multiple, uh, multiple sites can be distributed to multiple sites, can be distributed to multiple platforms, but can still effectively integrate with one another. So that's one good characteristic or one characteristic of the edge moving forward. Okay, next is uh, the edge 
will be autonomous. So, what we have here is the um, normal or the, the usual transit or life cycle of your data, right? So, there's the acquire stage wherein data is well, acquired from the edge devices that we have. There's an analyze stage, okay, wherein it's being processed. And based on that process data, information will be gathered, actionable information, and that's where the actions will be derived from, okay? And it's actually a cycle, all right? So if you're doing this in a distributed environment, if you have 100 branch offices, if you have 100 retail stores, and you ha each have edge computing platforms on all of them, you cannot expect your staff or your, your IT personnel or your, um, well, your IT staff to manage them one by one, okay? There has to be some degree of automation. AI and analytics will play a great role or a big role there, okay? So from the sources of data, usually you aggregate it, and then at the edge, as I've said earlier, you can already process it. Again, at the edge, you can already manage that data. And then at the edge, you can look around to AI and machine learning already. So data should be able, should be, um, should, you should be able to analyze data already through AI and machine learning, even at the edge. And then based on that, you can remediate, and then you can, the, the remediation can be learned for future reference, and then it can be embedded in the edge already. Also, data can, based on the managed data here, it can also be mined and sent to your cloud so that you can have predictive analytics or you can archive it, okay? So there are multiple paths for your data. It can be, it can cycle within the edge only, or you can actually transport it to your cloud within, uh, it, it, be it your private cloud or your public cloud, okay? So that's one characteristic of the edge. It needs to be autonomous. Lastly, it will need to be secure. It will be secure, all right? Not just from one standpoint, but from all uh, standpoints. It has to be a 360 degree security. You have to see, understand the data, and then protect the data. So these are the HPE solutions below that we use to make sure that the edge is secure. So we have clear pass device insight so we can see the devices gathering the data, okay? And based on that, based on that visibility, we have policy managers that can enforce the new policies based on the insights that we've derived from, that, uh, from those devices. We have InfoSight incorporating AI and machine learning to, um, to learn more about that data or the data being gathered. We have the silicon root of trust. This is a type of fingerprint, type of fingerprint that is embedded within the silicon of each client server that makes it tamper-proof. Okay, any sort of tampering, even in transit, even at firmware level, we can detect and remediate effectively. Okay, the, through our partners, we also have trusted platform module. And of course, we also secure the supply chain because a lot of um, breaches nowadays also happen while the devices are in transit for delivery. Okay. All right. So now that we are, we have an idea what the edge is, what, uh, why it makes sense to actually move computing to the edge and what will the edge look like in the future. Okay, let me tell you why it makes sense to have uh, multi-access edge computing. Okay, so these are the four main benefits of having MEC or multi-access edge computing, all right? So this is a typical 
uh, trajectory or path of data. Okay. So this is this is still the edge, right? This is considered the edge, and this is where the cloud begins. This is private cloud. This is public cloud, right? Okay. Every time you have to go through a front hole or back hole, you introduce, as I've said earlier, a lot of latency. And that latency affects quality of experience, okay? So quality of experience is the first of four. Four things that you can improve or get whenever you invest on multi-access edge computing. So the first one as I've said is maximize QoE or quality of experience. The second is cost reduction. The third is a faster time to market. And the fourth is new revenue streams, okay? So imagine at the edge, so multi-axis edge computing makes a lot of sense here because of the multi-axis part, okay? So having being able to engage data from Wi-Fi LTE, 5G, and more enables you to gather more data, enables you to aggregate more data. The more data you aggregate, the more you can correlate, and the more intelligent or the more value you derive from that data. But more on that later. So each time, for example, I'm gaming on my mobile phone. Each time I need, I click a command to my avatar, and that command needs to travel to the all the way to the cloud. I'm introducing up to 150 milliseconds or even higher of latency, and that makes the game unplayable. Right? If, however, if computing is, let's say, up to here only, edge computing, you only have 4% or uh, 4 milliseconds rather of latency, and that makes gives me the edge, uh, no pun intended, the edge when I am gaming. Okay. That's one. Uh, that's just one use case. Cost reduction, right? Because when you, whenever you need to transport data all the way to the core data center or internet or, or cloud, sorry, um, you have to back front hold and back hold that data. And this is not free. These links are usually the most expensive links or network, uh, network segments that to be maintained in our organization, okay? So the less you need to use these, the less you need to provision these, it will save you a great deal in terms of cost, all right? That's the second advantage. Third is time to market. So because the edge, as I've said earlier, will be autonomous, right? There's some sort, uh, there will be a big role or AI and machine learning there. If that is possible, if we are able to do that, then service changes or any rollout that you will need to do at the edge will be easier, right? Because you will have automation in place. So that's basically one of the use cases. And lastly, the fourth one, and this is the favorite for most organizations, especially those who are looking for digital transformation, um, new revenue streams, right? Imagine applications such as Waze, applications such as Grab. Those things, without LTE, it would have been impossible to apply or to, to launch those uh, new products, right? But because of that new innovation of LTE, you are now able to have to launch new products uh, um, at on new ideas, more new ideas from, from people, people like you. So organizations will have more time to innovate and act on those innovative ideas. That is the same effect that edge computing will have because it gives you a lot of freedom in terms of latency, a lot of freedom in terms of bandwidth, a lot of freedom in terms of security. So that in itself allows you a great number of opportunities for you to have new ideas and bring forth new products to the market, okay? All right, so because 
edge computing makes a lot of sense and multi-edge computing makes a lot of sense. It actually introduces a third type of cloud to the enterprise, right? First, first let me uh, explain to you what the, the two types of cloud uh, are what two types of cloud are prevalent nowadays in the data or, or within the organization? First is private cloud. These are your on-premise uh, data center resources. So this is your private cloud. The next one is public cloud. So these are your web scalers like AWS and Azure and GCP. And also, if you, of course, if you have multi-cloud, this is also part of public or private cloud. So this encompasses what we call the hybrid cloud. But this is these are centralized locations, right? These are where you backhaul your traffic to get to, to bring data to, okay? So the movement of data is usually the, uh, the third as cloud out. So basically you, you, you move from one cloud to another, okay? But the third type of cloud that edge computing introduces is the smart edge cloud. So this is where MEC comes in and it introduces a new type of stack, a unique type of stack. Uh, more on this later, right? A new type of architecture that needs to be maintained. So there are challenges to deploying edge computing, okay? So if uh, data flow here is called edge in, basically one edge site transporting data to another edge site is called edge in. So in this we expect this to happen a lot because what the future edge application would look like is that it doesn't have to transport that much data for it, for it to work. It will not have to transport data, backhaul data to your private or public cloud. It can share data with other edge devices, for, for example, for availability. If you need one edge site to catch uh, the users from another edge site whenever there's failure, that's one uh, big use case. Right. Okay. So the characteristics of these two uh, clouds usually they have general purpose hardware, they have virtualized multi-tenant software, and they have they need high performance networks. So most enterprises, most organizations are already ready for this because they have been building their private cloud and public cloud infrastructure for so long. But there are new challenges, new challenges that we are being brought about by edge computing, okay? One is environmental conditions. So you cannot always control the conditions at the edge. Okay? And that this demands different form factors. So depending on the environment at the edge, you have to adjust the form factor that you will use whenever you're building a platform there, okay? And it needs a smaller software footprint because the, the edge sites would be so many, you, you can't afford to deploy 42 new big rack cabinets there that, uh, that houses uh, a, a lot of your, a lot of, a bunch of servers, 42 new worth of servers, 42 new worth of storage, that cannot happen. It has to be a small form factor. And therefore, the resources on those machines tend to be smaller than what is inside your private cloud or public cloud data center, right? Given that the, small, the footprint of the software, the overhead that the software layer should demand from the platform should be considerably smaller as well. Okay? And you have to account for network performance you also have diverse ownership of domains. Domains is basically, I'll have a slide to further explain that later, but domains is basically having different types of applications being supported on the same platform. Because to be able to justify having a, a platform at your edge, a compute platform of your, at your edge, you're not going to deploy a separate platform for each type of application, right? So that, specific platform you also you, you will likely only have one platform at the edge that should be able to support that should be able to support multiple types of applications so there's a sort of consolidation that needs to happen there okay and provisioning and management at scale so
So these challenges, if uh, an organization is serious about edge computing, about provisioning uh, resources at the edge, they need to contend with these challenges. Right? And that these are exactly what HPE's MEC can address. Okay, so that what that's what makes HPE's MEC unique from normal edge computing platforms. Okay, so what 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 did I mean earlier about the domains, the multiple domains? So basically, what MEC or multi edge computing platform would entail? It should have infrastructure. Okay. It should have infrastructure that uh, it should have compute, storage, and networking. But the form factors and the environmentals for these devices can differ. So that's one great thing about HPE MEC is that we can support multiple types of hardware, multiple types of types of infrastructure at the edge. Right. Second thing, uh, the second component is the MEC platform itself. This is actually made up of uh, several components, which I'll be discussing later. And what this slide actually showcases uh, are the domains, the different domains. So we can have an open stack domain, we can have a containerized domain, we can even have an infrastructure as a service or bare metal domain. So this showcases the three types the three types of applications that can be housed on the same console in a consolidated manner on the same MEC platform. The first one is operator applications. So these are usually the virtual network functions of your telcos, routing, uh, virtual routing, virtual firewalls, virtual load balancers. Um, things that you usually have uh, separate or dedicated appliances for, you can now virtualize them on, a, on the same box within the same box, and that brings a lot of value. So that's one type of app, type of application that's supported by MEC or multi-access edge computing platform. The second one is large vertical applications. These are actually the usual application, the value generating or the revenue generating applications of every business. Right? For example, if you're, um, if you're a wayfinding company, if, if you're like Waze or, or Google Maps, uh, have uh, those servers that provide the mappings, the computation for the routes can sit on MEC and they're basically the bread and butter of your organization, right? They're the actual products of your organization, revenue generating products. So those are actually still supported or also supported on top of MEC. The third type of application that MEC supports are the small cloud apps. So imagine having a cloud at the edge, okay? So what I meant what by that is having an infrastructure as a service type of application at the edge that you can actually offer to your business units or even the external customers. You can host their applications for them at the edge, this is great because you can probably behave, you can practically behave like a web scaler. You can practically behave like an, a cloud provider, but you don't have the restrictions. You don't have the you don't have the restrictions of having high latency and having high cost of bandwidth. You don't even you can you can ease up on the egress charges. Egress charges are the traffic charges that uh, web scalers are known for. Those are the charges that give customers bill shock whenever they um, they try out public cloud and they become too eager to use public cloud, right? Okay, so those are the three types of applications that are supported on MEC or multi-access edge computing. So this is great because it, again, it, actually showcases how you can consolidate, how MEC can be shared across multiple tiers of applications. And this is great because you, by, the, by using this, you will be able to maximize the resources of MEC and therefore have more value derived from that platform. All right? 
Okay, so I keep on talking about MEC, multi-access edge platform. Let me dive a little bit deeper into the architecture of MEC. All right, so basically, these are usually the, um, the sources of data. So it can be your unmanned vehicle, it can be a connected vehicle, it can also be your wearables, um, smart glasses, etc. Of course, the more common one is the uh, video streaming applications. Also, you have, um, well, video streaming as well on your mobile phones. So you have those data sources, but you also have your traditional, let's say, mobile applications, your, your traditional applications that, runs, uh, that run at the edge. Those that don't have low latency requirements, okay? So which applications actually make sense to go into or to go on top of MEC? Okay. First of all, whenever you have multi-access, because these, these edge devices connect to your network on using different ways, you, using different access channels, right? That's why we have the term multi-access. So it can be through uh, 5G LTE or Wi-Fi here. Here it could be 5G. And then here it could be a wired connection. So it makes sense, or we have multiple access um, topologies or networks supported by MEC. So the best effort applications, those are those are, that are not uh, latency sensitive, they can go straight to your mobile core or your core network or your core data center, your cloud, because they don't really demand that much of a latency uh, that much latency from you or uh, that low of a latency from you. So you can still retain those types of applications. It still makes sense to have them uh, sir, um, hosted on your cloud or centralized data center. But for the rest, for the rest, MEC actually provides you with a full stack already in terms of how you want to process and manage those, uh, uh, those data. Okay, those, those applications. So first of all, it, it can provide the network function. So whether you need traffic offloading, whether you need firewalling or address translation it can already provide that. And also it can provide you with a platform for the applications themselves. You can provide, you can have the game server hosted at the edge on the edge network using MEC, okay? And uh, if, if you want edge content delivery, so you can also have that. Analytics can also have that at the edge already. Aside from that, aside from those, um, you already have platform management. Okay, you can already manage uh, all of these, all of these at the edge. So you don't have to rely on, it's completely autonomous. You don't have to rely on the, a centralized a management system also, although you can still have that, um, you don't have to rely on that that much to manage the edge computing happening at your edge site. Okay. And this is all possible by a virtual uh, by a virtual uh, virtualization uh, virtualization layer that is uh, supported by MEC. Okay, in terms of law of economics, you can reduce cost by via reducing bandwidth. As I've said earlier, this is very effective if you have video to be processed at the edge um, instead of backhauling large files, large amounts of video data to a centralized location, you can just process it, there, process, uh, process it then and there at the edge. In terms of law of physics, uh, reduce latency at the edge. If, uh, my favorite use case, my favorite example is gaming. Uh, this will if the edge can already host your gaming server, that will greatly improve latency and game performance and user experience will improve as well. Law of placement. So if you only have to protect the edge and you don't need to worry about that much about uh, transporting the data so, uh, through so many layers of your network, then 
you can have more security and you can uh, have less problems in terms of compliance because if it's within the edge, most likely you don't have to uh, to deal with data sovereignty issues if you have public cloud and the likes of that. Okay, but still, of course, you have access to core communication and also. Uh, this is another point. You can sense, infer, and act. This is gather, analyze, and act on the data right at the edge. It doesn't even have to hit the wire towards your um, centralized sites. But if you need to learn from the operations, learn from your data, you can still have edge to cloud communication, right? If you need uh, AI training, um, the video repositories or command and control center because there will be a lot of edge sites to be managed. So you still have to have centralized management uh, or a centralized view of all the edge sites that you will have, all the edge platforms that you will have. So just so you can have that visibility. So that still can be um, housed at the cloud for your data center, right? Okay, having said that, what is exactly inside multi-edge, um, multi-access edge computing or MVC platform, all right? So let me walk you through some of the components, high level. So from the user equipment or the UE, it talks to, uh, this is actually the edge site or the MEC platform deployed at the edge site. So within the MEC platform, you have the VEdge, component. This is the component that talks directly to the user, okay, the user device or user equipment. And it's the one that routes, routes the traffic to the application itself. So these are the applications on top of MEC. This can be your VNFs, your virtual network functions, or even your enterprise applications, or even your IS applications, right? Okay. These reside on top of a smart API gateway. So this is key because it provides routing, discovery, A and A. Okay. So these basically um, provide integration support. So integration for the different layers of the MEC platform and also different applications as well. Okay. You'll have a, a service registry. Okay. And it will have its own MEC platform manager. So the platform manager will take charge of application, the application packages, the life cycle of the applications, resource management, so um, application fault uh, management, and application performance. So these are all being managed, not at the central side, but you can already have this at the edge side. All of these components, sit on top of a VIM or a virtual infrastructure manager. This can be a KVM, this can be OpenStack, can even be a containerized deployment or environment as well. So that's the edge deployment or the edge components. We also have at the centralized side, we also have the MIO. So basically this is the management, the centralized management platform. So uh, multi, uh, multi-access edge platform management is here, resource management as well, inventory management, life cycle, of course, application resource fault management, we have a centralized version of this one, and performance management as well. So basically, this is a centralized dashboard for all the edge sites, because the edge sites will be more than one, most likely. So you'll have, a, you need to have a central pane of glass for that. Of course, uh, we also have the MEC platform portal, wherein these applications like the OSS, the self portal, and MEC platform can be integrated to, or MEC federation can be integrated with. Okay, this integration or this platform portal is important because it allows these things to leverage on number one, the resources of MEC, and number two, the actual data that is being gathered from the 
user uh, equipment or the end users. Okay, so these are basically the high-level components of MECR, multi-axis edge computing. All right, so again, what types of use cases actually make sense for MEC? Okay, it matters, uh, a lot of it uh, has, uh, has something to do with latency, okay? So these are the, this is the edge, and as we go here, latency increases, okay, up to the public cloud. So you can see that distance plays a major role, and also use case plays a major role because these use cases usually have their own latency requirements. So for smart factory use cases, office use cases, um, those that need almost real time, uh, uh, response time. So latency has to be low, approximately eight milliseconds. Um, these are actually like 40 kilometers and below uh, or, or closer. So this is within M MEC. It uses enterprise gateways, okay? For VR, AR games that need uh, less than 20 milliseconds, to 10 to 15 approximately, or automate, automotive and robotics, these need close to real time, response time. So the sites here typically range from um, 100 kilometers to 500 kilometers. It uses 5G gateway, okay? 5G uh, gateway, but it still resides on MEC. So multi-access is apparent here because you can do con uh, direct connectivity you can do connectivity using your enterprise gateway, or you can do even connectivity using a 5G gateway. So it can bring different types of performance, um, different types of latency, different amounts of latency. Now, if you are okay, if your application is okay with more than 30 to 100 milliseconds of latency, then you're fine with public cloud or your centralized data center. So for traditional applications, you're still fine there, but if your application would need more response time, so MEC is the right one for you. Okay. So since I'm talking about uh, the use cases already, let's uh, dive into the exciting part. I'll, I'll showcase some of the great use cases and scenarios where, where MEC makes a lot of sense. Okay, so there's a there's a wide gamut of things or use cases for MEC, right? First of all, the edge cloud can have connectivity from 5G to Wi-Fi to wired connections, right? And it can benefit applications uh, or can house applications benefiting consumers up to the enterprise. So if you have a VR gaming or... Um, for example, connected emergency services. So these are usually connected, if you're a mobile gamer, uh, you're usually connected to 5G or LTE. Um, and th that's the same for emergency services that's supported by Edge Cloud. At the enterprise end of things, if you need high resolution video, col video col collaboration that usually is wired, um, or in-building and campus IOP that's usually wired, still supported on the same edge cloud, okay? So this is where it showcases multi-access. Okay. So by industry, so this is this uh, slide actually uh, tells you more about the industries that are being supported or that have valid use cases for edge computing or MEC, okay? So media and entertainment, you can also obviously have immersive gaming, you can have interactive learning, um, unified enterprise communication. So these are the legends. So you can have real-time automation, enhanced video, and AR and VR. So these are the use cases for media and entertainment. Manufacturing also has a, a lot of use cases. So virtual training, uh, smart helmets. I, I'll have a slide for that later. Imagine being able to assist someone at the plant uh, and having an expert call in 
from a, from another location and they have uh, being able to guide uh, that plant worker using wearables uh, that's that's a great use case factory workflow automation uh, connected uh, of course a lot of remote monitoring when you have manufacturing uh, connected goods connected workers logistics and warehousing these are all uh, automated uh, remotely monitored using edge computing okay a lot of the retail use cases have to do with real-time automation. So for example, smart shelves using augmented reality where in Chromos would pop up if you're using uh, wearables like Google uh, like uh, Google Glass or something to that effect. Dynamic price tags, price tags that, uh, that change whenever you uh, have a promo, special promo or sale. You don't have to manually change or put stickers for tags. The tags can change uh, in terms of the price on the tags can change depending on uh, in real time, depending on the promos that you have. So of course, a big uh, industry that will benefit a lot from this is automotive, automotive and transportation. So assisted driving, autonomous driving, emergency braking. Those use cases are all made possible or made easier through edge computing, right? Because of the, the dramatic increase in response time. Being real-time really helps. Financial services also benefit. Healthcare, this is, uh, this is very uh, relevant with the pandemic right now. So imagine being able to... So now we have teleconsulting, right? But, um, but ha being able to uh, remotely perform surgery in a more accurate fashion because lag is dramatically reduced. So remote surgery would be faster, more, eff more effective, more efficient now. Remote diagnosis would be more efficient because uh, collaboration, video collaboration would be easier to do or more responsive. So And precision medicine. So these things, uh, remote operation use cases, are, are are very relevant now with the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, right? Of course, energy and utilities will have real-time automation use cases, smart grid, smart metering, uh, distrib distributed feeder lines and automation systems. Uh, these are great use cases targeted towards energy and utilities. Government sectors can also have that uh, have this uh, this is also very applicable in terms of the pandemic. Having smarter cities with contextual services. For example, if your city is smarter, wherein everyone can be uh, willing to participate and have their mobile phones tagged and can uh, will know where, uh, where the large concentration of uh, PUIs or PUMs are. And then we can take measures to avoid that general area uh, when we travel or when we walk around the smart city that will make the city a lot safer and also um, well a lot healthier than uh, than what we have right now or we, we can address a lot of the problems that we have in terms of social distancing in terms of um, quarantine the likes where bearer management, of course, the network resource optimization use cases are also uh, possible for telecom operators. These are all MEC or edge computing use cases across all industries. It means everyone can benefit from edge computing, right? So let me go through briefly uh, through some of the use cases. For one good use case is using augmented reality and VR to in terms of retail. Okay, so when uh, a shopper goes in, they can have depending on what they share with uh, with the organization or or the company, they can have targeted advertise advertisements. They can have location based during the pandemic because interaction will be a, a lot less. With, um, with retail employees because they don't have to ask so many questions where, where, where can I find this, where can I find that. 
can already have turn by turn wayfinding. Um, aside from that, the benefits from the customer customer are apparent, but there's also a lot of benefits for the retail company as well. So they can have they can take a look at dwell time, they can have a look at demographic analytics, POS management, people tracking. This is, uh, this is very useful if you want to implement social distancing. Uh, people tracking is one of great way to, to monitor and implement proper social distancing. Okay, this is a smart station, a robotic and AI service being rolled out in Thailand, wherein uh, they can have a, ro a robotic assistant that can respond to emergencies, you take your temperature, you can ask questions too. So they, it lessens a lot of contact, unnecessary contact. Um, so it, it, it helps you with uh, social distancing, uh, pandemic procedures and protocols. So this is a great use case. We also have AI services for passenger safety. So this can, by, by virtue of the cameras, CCTV cameras, you can actually have, uh, you can detect possible causes of emergencies, um, the, uh, riders or, or travelers, commuters who are stepping on the yellow lines, um, unstable travelers or commuters, so you can detect them. And this is... Uh, a favorite of mine. It's an automation wheelchair, an automated wheelchair, a wheelchair that is self-driving. You can use it to take you even to take you where you need to be, even though you don't know your way uh, through through the, uh, through the station. It has its own way finding. And after you use it, it finds its way back. You don't have to manually return it. It finds its way back to where it's supposed to be, where it's supposed to be stored. Okay, and of course, you can override this uh, remote control or manual control is also available. So this is a great use case, actually. Next is a use case that's close to my heart, um, localized game streaming. So we all know uh, that uh, the first generation or the wave one of gaming, right? It's using consoles and, of course, PCs uh, and now mobile phones, right? Can provide you higher solution, but it's lat latency intolerant, right? If you have lots of lots of latency, definitely you, you, you cannot beat anyone, especially if you're into competitive gaming. And that's that causes high cost overhead, right? Wave two, uh, if you're familiar with Google Stadia, there's now cloud gaming. The game, the game is hosted or installed at the cloud, and then it's streamed like a video into your machine. So it, it provides low resolution, unfortunately, because it's bandwidth dependent. Um, and latency, uh, it's latency tolerant now, but you still have that delay, right? If you don't have that proper internet connection, you still have that delay. And moderate cost of overhead, because it, it, you can play with, you don't need a beefy device anymore to play that because the resources are in the cloud. But this is still this still has a lot of latency problems, right? Wave three will be brought about by edge cloud gaming. So imagine if your server, gaming server, is located within the same city, uh, 100 kilometers away only. The latency improvement, the delays would be uh, greatly reduced, right? Games from high to low resolution would be supported. Uh, you can now bypass console costs. You can play from any device ready. And because you can play from any device, yet it's still running on one platform or a single platform, R&D for the game developers is minimized. So lower cost in terms of games, right? So it, you can also align cost to consumption and revenues, and you can leverage the low latency edge, especially for competitive gaming. So this is a great, a great use case for me. Gaming using the edge, gaming at the edge, as I call it. Uh, closely related to this is actually content delivery uh, through uh, and training through 360 virtual reality. So training, whether it's in law enforcement or anything actually, can be more immersive if you can deliver it via augmented reality or virtual reality. 
And with Edge, it's entirely possible to have an instructor from another location uh, stream uh, virtual reality training to a lot of attendees, multiple attendees from multiple locations. Okay. Also, video orchestration um, out of venue VR or 360 live streaming. So imagine if there's a venue or a stadium wherein there are multiple cameras and you being a remote viewer, being able to, to choose the angle that you want to view the event from, even mobile phones. So that, that puts you uh, at a better seat, basically, than the one that the attendees on the actual venue, right? Because they only have one point of view, but you will have multiple points of view. So that, that's uh, a great use case as well. Of course, we have a video conferencing, edge-in type of video conferencing, wherein edge-to-edge, -edge uh, low latency, edge-to-edge, -edge, for example, city-to-city -city video collaboration can happen without having to uh, backhole everything to a data center at the cloud. Like, for example, right now, I'm using Zoom to, re to record this presentation, so I know that whatever I'm feeding to my camera, whatever, whatever my camera is capturing, it's being streamed to a cloud server somewhere in China and then being streamed back to me for feedback. So that uh, it introduces a lot of latency and uh, the resolution supported will not be as high. Uh, but if you have edge to edge like this, um, if I, my Zoom server, for example, is located the nearest cell site, uh, or like the nearest date, uh, the nearest city, um, the next city to me, it, it will dramatically improve the resolution that I can achieve and the latency that or the response time of the video that I can achieve. Right? Okay, this is a very compelling use case actually. The visual remote guidance or trusted collaboration. So for example, you're a factory worker. You need to repair something very urgent on your factory floor because the factory operations is uh, completely halted. Work in process is uh, is going oh, going to as as high as the roof, and then you need to 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 repair that broken device somewhere in the assembly line, right? And your expert is like three hours or worse couple of days away from getting to you. You can actually use no hands heads up displays to collaborate with them. And it's not just a normal video call because it has a heads up display that can use augmented reality to display the schematics on the, on the side or the person guiding you. Uh, you can show it to him. You can look at the problem from your perspective and he can give you the resources on your heads up display that you need the instructions where you can, you can even uh, project his hand that, so that you can point the objects to you, you can point stuff to you. That's a very compelling uh, use case for factory uh, or manufacturing as of the moment, okay? The next use case is video delivery, uh, video caching and acceleration. So you can actually now cache video at the edge so that you can deliver it with low latency. So obviously not all video content will be, um, will be cached, but commonly accessed, frequently accessed video content will allow you to deliver video faster and with uh, less cost than what we normally do today, right? Pulling it straight from the cloud. Okay. Uh, this use case is very compelling as well. So unmanned vehicle data processing. Imagine being able to deliver, deliver packages via drones, small packages, of course, via drones and having, uh, being able to actually, because of the low latency, being able to actually remote control the drones, even if you can't see them anymore, because you already have edge computing and you already have 5G. So this is very relevant now in the pandemic. So you don't have to uh, put riders as, at risk a lot of the uh, most of the time for small packages. 
can be sent via drones, and um, yeah, that's a great use case. And this uh, last use case that I'm going to show you right now is for hybrid education, safer schools. This is actually a use case that um, we've won an award with in the, P the recent PM forum. So it's the best new catalyst in show. Uh, the, the use case is called uh, Becoming Edgy, wherein we uh, showcase uh, be having smarter and safer schools for hybrid education, even remote learning and uh, video using video collaboration, digital content, augmented reality and virtual reality, and uh, authority management components. So we integrated them together and even if at edge site schools or smart campuses, this can be um, deployed. So this is a very compelling uh, use case as well. All right. So actually, those are all the use cases. And uh, this is my second to the last slide. Some key takeaways from my presentation. So there's actually an explosion of data happening at the edge right now of all organizations, of all organizations everyone has an ex is encountering an explosion of data at their edge, right? And the edge is where we sense and we can now process and act on these pieces of information or data by using several access options, right? So even though uh, we access these data differently, it can be supported into a central unified platform, and that's what we call multi-access edge computing, right? And lastly, HPE and our partners help pioneer this way of leveraging data for future use and future innovations by the likes of you. So hopefully, uh, this has opened your mind to new possibilities, new innovations possible because of this new trend of edge computing. So. I hope um, this has been informative for you. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in for the Globe 5 Hackathon. My name is Vinod Bishlani. Just a quick introduction about myself. I've been working in the industry for almost two decades. Office the last 10 years have been on designing and implementing AI solutions for smart cities. My focus has been intelligent command center solutions where I worked on ingesting data from various data sources, like IoT data sources, IoT sensors, video feeds, and some non-traditional data sources like Wi-Fi and social media. I've fused all of these together to generate actionable insights operators to act on and all this is is uh, the core of all this is AI models and big data in the back end. One of the most interesting projects I worked on was identifying train incidents using Wi-Fi data, just purely using the commuter Wi-Fi data, no GPS data involved, um, but purely just taking the commuter Wi-Fi data and reconstructing the overall network. And once you identify the incident, you generate response plans uh, based on historical historical baseline data, which has been generated in the past, right? Um, again, here, um, just, to, just to give a flavor of the results and the power of AI, um, post, post implementation of this project, we were able to reduce the impact on commuters of an incident by more than 100% which was in the range of 45 minutes to one hour. But through this right, power, uh, the, the amount of impact which it can have on, on, on citizens' lives, on, on commuters. In this case, the commuters, um, any big city would have close to a million, two million commuters. And if you're able to reduce the impact of an incident by 45 minutes, you can imagine the impact it can have back on the economies right? so so this is uh, this is real right and um and um and ai is going to explore we'll talk a little bit more in details as we go through the session uh, but just just to give so currently i'm i'm leading the ai equity practice for hp findings and and this is a broader role right where i just don't look at smart cities but i cut across industries like fsi manufacturing public sector 
and of course Tiokov, where, where AI is the growth engine. The topic I'm going to talk about is how to accelerate AI, and more specifically, how do you how do you industrialize AI in enterprises? When you look at industrialization of AI, you realize that AI is more than more than just building cold prediction models. Also, it's not the same as traditional software development. Later in this session, I'll talk about the challenges which currently the industry is facing to bring AI in production and then go towards how I've worked with customers to solve these challenges. This might be a slightly different topic considering you guys have come here to build a quick prototype, but the intent of the organizers here was for you guys to build an understanding on how you guys can take these prototypes further and build a production ready system. So to start with, why do we need to industrialize AI? Why do we need to accelerate AI? The answer is AI today is one of the top most priority for all the organizations. Pretty much all the research studies, Gartner, Forrester, you name it what, will show you that the top two of the three priorities for CIOs are advanced analytics and AI. Just to throw in some statistics, total loss 20, 15 to 20% of the new infrastructure deployed is to support AI workloads and it's expanding at an estimated growth of about 2.7% over the next four years, which means if the market size today is 100, by the next year, next year, next four years is gonna be 270. So the growth is closer, right? And and that's 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 on the on the on the charter top priority for all the organizations, and everybody wants to accelerate AI. They want to take the business advantages which AI can give them. But there is a problem. Despite these growth statistics, huge investments going in in AI, um, in terms of resources, in terms of initiative takers, in terms of the infrastructure, along with the universal understanding that AI can provide them a competitive edge, the numbers are really bad, right? If you look at only 15% of the data science projects are going in production today, right? Which means close to a rough, rough estimate about one project out of every 10 project makes it to production. So let's dig in a bit deeper. What are the reasons behind these failures? It's a combination of business and technical reasons, right? To look at the business reasons, right? The first one is, is not having enough business value for the initiative which has been taken, or, or I would say most of the times, not communicating the business value to the decision maker is one of the causes, big causes of failures. Second is the overall cost of the overall cost of the project is not calculated up front and the investments have not been secured. Right? You start with a low cost EOC, uh, which which was successful. But once you once you need to bring in the entire data says the whole nine the whole nine years, right? The implementation, the maintenance costs are are prohibitive, right? And the and the project gets shelved, right? Uh, so these two, two are, are, are one of the major business reasons. Going into technical reasons, right? We all like technology, right? So, so this, is, this, is, um, this is one of the top most reasons, I would say, right? Uh, um, the, what you see in the slide here, MLOps is not equal to DevOps, right? That, that understanding of the execution of AI project to production is, is something which is lacking, right? So when you look at um, look at enterprise AI, it's not just about data scientists. Uh, it's about it's about data scientists working together with the business and business analysts to understand the problem which you need to solve, and also collaborating with the software engineers, data engineers, operational specialists, cybersecurity, right, to deliver an efficient solution which can run in production. Right? The seamless integration between the teams. Is 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 not is not DevOps, right? It's not traditional software development, right? Uh, that's where that's where ML Ops comes into the picture, right? Which will go in the details of right, right? That's that's the core piece which I want to talk about, right? 
um, and then and, and we'll see if we'll see how it differentiates and what do you need to bring that ML ops culture in the organization is the later slides, right? But to finish off with the reason, the last reason, right, which is which is also which is also which I see in the industry is about infrastructure issues, right? ID infrastructure issues, right? The planning which is needed to get the data center ready for AI is, is sometimes a cause as well. AI does need significant compute capacities as well as storage. There is no AI without big data. GPUs are needed for high performance, large scale AI. And sometimes organizations start without these requirements in mind and then and when it strikes, it's just too late to, to recover. Right? So the planning is needed. Right? Um, and at HPE, uh, we sort of covered all these, uh, all these issues which we have mentioned about. Uh, but I'll, I'll specifically talk about ML ops uh, in in details because this that's something which uh, which as developers as data scientists you guys need to understand uh, to get your solution in production. So let's look at the overall project cycle for an AI ML project. Say, just take an example: a customer churn for telco in this case, right? The project starts with the data scientists and, and, and the business analysts discussing about the problem statement, right? Whether it's a churn on, on um, postpaid customer, prepaid customers, what exactly is happening? What, what exactly is what you're trying to solve here, right? Um, then the data scientist works with the data engineer to understand what data is available and gets that data extracted, a sample data extractor or data lakes, right? The data scientists use that data to build models on Python, R, or, or these days, uh, possibly some auto AI tooling, right? Uh, the results of these models, right? Once once you get the once you get fair estimates about about what's what, what you're able to deliver these models are shared with the business analyst via um, some form, maybe in Excel, PowerPoint. Um, which which both of these guys collaborate and then select the model, right? Once the model is finalized, um, the handover comes to the software engineer, which looks at the output of these models using an API. And it most, sometimes also there is refactoring needed by the software engineer from a performance perspective, right? Uh, that, that's possible, right? I've seen that happen quite a bit in my projects, right? Where the, the model which was developed was not able to handle enough amount of data, which is which is which which is what needed, right? So some refactoring is needed. Uh, but 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 an API access is what the software developer is looking for, right? Once all of this is ready, right? The model, the API, the interfaces, which needs to expose back to the uh, reporting tier, all this is in, checked in in a, in a source control like Git, right? And then comes the ops team, right? Which is building the CI CD pipeline for these components, right? The security comes, security team comes in as part of the CI CD pipeline, that's like ops uh, to review the security aspects. And then your churn model along with the interfaces is deployed in production. Right. Now comes the differentiating part here, right? Once the model is running in production, um, it needs to be constantly monitored. The model drift is a reality. As the data changes, the model is gonna change, the results are gonna change. It needs constant monitoring um, and the feed gap, feedback mechanism needs to be developed. The data scientist needs to understand what's happening in in uh, in, in real time, possibly um, as much as possible. Right? What are the results? Right? If there's a drift happening or not? Right? And then they need to recalibrate uh, or retrain their models to make it accurate. Right? So to sum it up, right, it's, it's, it's a loop, right? Unlike uh, traditional software development where you hand over, it runs in production, just the ops teams needs to be involved. No, but data science projects, AI projects are, 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 are constantly to be monitored um, and trained retrained if need, if need be, right? So the collaboration is key here, right? All the stakeholders need to come together to deliver a successful, AI project in production, right? and that culture is what called is ML ops, right? All organizations have to build this culture of ML ops 
uh, to to accelerate their AI initiatives, to to bring AI to production, and and there is there there are solutions available in the market, right? HP ourselves, we've got the ML Ops platform where all these actors can come together and work together on a on a single platform. Um, to to expedite expedite delivery to expedite moving towards this culture. Uh, the important thing with such platforms is that you reduce the manual handover right between the data scientists, between the data engineer, between the business analysts. Um, and the manual manual effort can be cut down, which can then bring the ML ops reality much faster than what you're going to be doing in any manual process. Really. So let's take a bit deeper into the HP SMLOps platform. Well, what, 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 what the MLOps platform provides is, is a basic set of, basic set of services which which the data engineers, the data scientists, the app developers, the DevOps teams are going to need while executing an AI or AI ML project. Uh, from a from a from a business perspective, what this platform provides is is faster time to market, uh, reduce risk in executing the project, increase flexibility, um, increase elasticity, right? which is which is which is sort of the basic principle for any successful project. Well, if you, if you, uh, let's let's look at from a from a solution architecture view. Right now, we'll give you how these benefits are actually provided by the platform. This slide sort of has the overall view of of what this platform is about. Right? Starting from the bottom, right, um, you see this platform can be deployed on on um, on edge, on prem, and public cloud, as well as hybrid cloud. Um, Hybrid cloud deployments, right? So, so pretty flexible platform in terms of deployment topologies. Um, in fact, you can install this on a bare metal server or a virtualized environment. So, if you want to, um, if you want to avoid, um, if you want to avoid any virtualization tier for performance reasons or for cost reasons, you can still go ahead and do that. And like I said, right? So, hybrid cloud deployment is also supported, right? So, if you if you want to keep your data back on prem and and all your AI AI workloads on the public cloud, you can still go ahead and do that. Right? Uh, going towards the top, right, the global data fabric, as the name suggests, what this component provides is a a base set of um, base set of storage, right, which can be which can be utilized for container persistence, can be utilized for any. Uh, any big data workloads, right? So it, it has a built-in big data repository, as well as a adapter. I mean, I call it an adapter. In in, in uh, MLOps terms, it's it's uh, it's called a data cap functionality, but it's, it's basically an adapter which can connect back to external HDFS storage, S3 storage, or file-based systems like NFS. What this does is is it removes or it eliminates the manual handover of files between the data engineer and the data scientist, right? Um, so, so this is this is I would say one of one of the big differentiators for the platform because it it um, it brings in the automation which is needed for for the data scientists to quickly start off with testing their things, right? Going towards the container based control plane. What this is about is is a is a admin console which can which can create which can which supports creating multiple tenants and then clusters for those tenants, right? So a multi-tenant containerized platform is what is deployed. What was it managed by this by this MLOps platform? You can you can go to the resource level as well, right? So um, kind of do GPU um, uh, GPU for a specific cluster. CPUs in, in normal normal processes for specific processes, right? So, so all those all those um, uh, private cloud like features are available via the via the uh, via the container control plane. Going towards the Kubernetes, Kubernetes is the is the is the is the is the, is the orchestration engine which is uh, which is supported by this platform. Um, I think one of the platform one of the only platforms I would say supports hundred percent upstream Kubernetes, right? Uh, so which 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 basically means it's it's got the maximum portability 
across across going across across other Kubernetes clusters. Right? It also provides support to multiple versions of Kubernetes running in the same uh, same environment, right? So one cluster can be running on 1.1.9, the other could be running on 1.1.7, right? So all unnecessary migrations at times when when it's not really business justified, right? So you can run all these things together at, 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 at one go, right? Going towards the security here, um, um, like static security, all the static security is provided, the AD integration, LDAP integration, Carbros for your big data repositories, a load balancer uh, for uh, for decoupling your, your web tier from your microservices tier, uh, SSO encryption, all the communication between these components can be, can be encrypted and, and, and can be secure. Right? Um, it also provides um, a, a way to store your um, your secure VMs, right? So if you have any standards across your organization about security levels, you can you can you can um, you can you can create those images, and those images can be utilized to create the clusters as well. On the top is is sort of the secret sauce for this overall platform. It's it is called the app here, right? It's 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 the app store uh, for MLOps, which is segregated via personas, right? So, so every um, every persona has their set of apps available in the app store, and they can spin up those apps um, in a, in a matter of minutes, right? Rather than rather than rather than uh, having weeks to deploy one of their images and all of it, right? So automation. Uh, is the key for any successful AI project, and this app store is exactly what uh, what is needed for a accelerated fast track AI project. Right. So if you look, uh, get a little bit deeper into the app store uh, for data engineers, uh, what it provides is a big data analytics app store where you can where where all these all these uh, big data uh, big data platforms are are templatized, right? So you can spin up a Cloudera cluster uh, if, if, if it's needed for some test purposes in a matter of minutes, right? All the components inside the big data repository, big data uh, Cloudera repository can be deployed in, in, in a matter of minutes, right? So it's all templatized, right? Uh, same with the Spark cluster, if you want to use a, if they want to create a, a Spark streaming cluster for data ingestion, can be can be done automatically. Uh, Kafka, the same thing, right? So, um, so again, I mean, um, the level of automation which it brings out of box is 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 amazing. Well, I would say, um, spinning a, a cloud data cluster in minutes is is something which is which which not um, not other platforms will provide. Right? Then going towards the data scientists right which is which is the AI ML data science templates right you can spin up a tensorflow Jupyter notebook even going towards auto AI H2 SAS data IQ in a matter of minutes I would say right? so this is this is this is important right the reason I say this is because data scientists are not typical software developers. they are developers but not like software developers they don't have a limited set of tools and their set of tools sort of keep expanding, right? Um, so, so, so from a ML ops perspective, from a from an effective AI platform perspective, you need to be able to provide them the automation which is needed to spin up these environments to to do their testing for us enough, which can which can show the business value. You don't want your data scientists to be to be to be um, to be installing tools and and putting up time on this, right? Their core is to analyze data. A platform deployment is not something which they should be focusing on. Though. So the automation, the app store of libraries, which 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 are provided as part of the Esmeral yeah, MLOps platform, are are are, um, are, um, are are any any data scientist wish list. I would say right. So that's that's where I was saying the faster time to market is is is, is here right. Um, that the data scientist not being Investing time into some things which they are not. Then comes the app modernization um, apps, right? Which is which are geared to the app developers, right? It's pretty standard, right? The Java development tools, .NET PHP development tools are also provided as part of the platform. Right? Uh, they going towards the DevOps, right? This is this is again one of the important 
with the CICD. But as part of the platform, um, there, there are called the project repositories and the model register, which is which is enabled by the platform. So any project which has been developed by the data scientists on the platform using the using the platform capability, they are able to provision it back um, via 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 this project repository to GitHub or any other source control system. Right? Um, they can version their, um, their their models, right? Um, uh, we, which can which can be picked up by the CI/CD pipeline, and, and and the builds can be created out of it, right? It also goes further down to create uh, a, a web service on top of the models automatically. Right? These web services, these REST services, can be utilized by the app developers to create uh, services uh, based on these models, right? And then, as well as I mean, uh, given given the integration with with source controls, um, if there is a bias or if there's a, if there's a model drift happening, these um, these um, uh, these can be pulled back from the source control pretty pretty easily as part of the as part of the continuous integration cycles, right? Uh, again, I would say um, uh, it's just not the one one point I want to highlight here is just not limited to the source control source. And the, the model code, but it you can also you can also store the training data, which is which is associated with that model version, right? So it goes was a level above that. Right? So in all um, in all, I would say this platform is 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 something which is which is um, critical for uh, for for building a, a ML ops culture in your organization, and that's what is the goal. Uh, with which this platform was designed with. To give you guys a broader picture of how we engage with our customers on their AI journey AI initiatives and what's worked for us in the past is this explore, experiment and evolve strategy. In the explore phase, we work with our customers to identify their business goals. We understand their AI ML readiness, their ML ops maturity, and based on this information, we define a AI transformation roadmap for them based on their goals, based on their information. This is the phase where we address the failures which we talked about in the previous slides, right? The business failures and the operational failures to bring AI to production. In the experiment phase, we take the customer further. We work with them on POVs for the high priority use cases which have been defined in the roadmap. Right, the AI transformation roadmap, which was created in the explore phase. During this phase, we create the overall business case for their AI journey based on the POV which we have just executed. Right, so so it, it's just pretty close to what's going to happen in um, in real life. Right, so that's based on the data out of the POV. In the evolve phase is where we get the customer to production. We work with the customer. Uh, to 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 bring the ML ops culture, which is needed for productionizing AI and scaling up AI, most of our customers engage with us to build a full stack ML ops platform, integrated sometimes integrated with auto AI platforms as well as open source capabilities. Yes, um, as data scientists, uh, as software engineers, working on it, uh, which will need both uh, both both platforms both open source as well as auto AI to accelerate their journey. Once this base platform is ready, we utilize our industry specific reference architectures. We've got reference architectures, we've got Talco, FSI, uh, MDI, factories, public safety, public sector domains, uh, which we overlay on top of their, on top of the customer AI transformation roadmap. Uh, to to de-risk their engagement, to, to de-risk their journey towards the AI. Right? So this uh, this sort of broadly um, defines how we work with our customers and what's uh, what's helped us uh, to to reduce the overall risk. Right, We're talking about uh, numbers which are which are um, which are close to fifteen percent of the projects going to production. Uh, this is this is the engagement model which has sort of helped us improve on that, right? improve on that, and make 
uh, de-risk the customer journey to 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 AI and maximize their investments in AI. Before I conclude this session, I wanted to give you guys an idea about about our our um, design thinking based workshop, right? Which we conduct in the in the explore phase, right? Which is where I talked about understanding the customer business goals, understanding their AI ML readiness, and then creating the roadmap. This is sort of the details of it to give you a flavor of what's happening in these workshops, right? Typically, um, these workshops, depending upon the complexity, can 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 go on from a day to a week. Right, where we engage with our customers to understand their, their understand their industry, understand their business goals in in um, in near term and long term. We go through the use cases, which is happening in the customer industry as well as what they are trying out. We understand their readiness in terms of skills, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of their ML ops maturity and then create a overall economics models based on the use cases which we have discussed, right? And then going towards the transformation journey where economics is the core part of any business model or any business engagement. And that's something which we bring it up up front as part of this, uh, as part of these workshops, right? Uh, to risk the business uh, business failures which we have seen in the past, right? So with this, I conclude my session on accelerating AI. Thanks uh, for investing in time to, to listen to listen to me on Exploring AI. If you guys have any question, uh, feel free to connect with me on my LinkedIn. I'll be happy to help you guys uh, with any queries, uh, any support needed. And uh, finally, best of luck for your for your hackathon. Um, I'm sure you guys are going to do pretty well in there, and 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 I hope that you know, whatever work whatever time you invest into this hackathon, you're able to take this forward to uh, to a production grade system. Thanks again. Hello everyone. My name is Sunil. Today, I'm going to present how Wi-Fi is delivering seamless connectivity in fast-tracking enterprise digital transformation journey. We have all heard about 5G. Some of the key forces which are driving 5G adoption are increasing bandwidth capacity by massively densifying network deployment and by more efficiently using existing spectrum. Also, we are aggregating the additional spectrum, but operators don't stop there. 5G will also help in maintaining subscriber visibility by indoor coverage and uninterrupted mobility between outdoor and indoor. This will help in managing cost as we are going to have general purpose reconfigurable hardware resources with open interface among the core network components and the components which is running at the edge. Also, we will be able to exploit the unlicensed spectrum, which runs in 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. 5G is capturing new markets beyond consumers. 5G helps in establishing enterprise small cells and IoT footprint by delivering a managed network services. The mobility challenge, which was not solved by cable operator, can be solved by 5G. If you look at 5G, 5G consists of various technology, like 5G new radio, 
which consists of massive MAMO, integration of multi-wave spectrum, and unlicensed aggregation. Also, 5G have next generation mobile core consisting of NFE, network slicing, and technology agnostic RAM. Also, what we are seeing, the emergence of a multi-access edge computing, which is migrating the compute and the storage resources to the edge. MEC provide the local traffic breakout so that the data can be processed at the edge so that the inference can be made at the edge with the management of a heterogeneous networks, which can be done at the edge. Also, we are seeing technology like fixed wireless access can be enhanced with the line of sight backhaul links and a flexible and efficient delivery of capacity. What we are seeing is a parallel evolution of a Wi-Fi standards to meet today's need. If we look at Wi-Fi, except mobility, unlicensed technologies like Wi-Fi like Wi-Fi is evolving to meet 5G requirements in terms of a peak data rate, latency, or a traffic capacity in a dense area. 5G network slicing will enable operator to address specific connectivity need for all industry verticals. 5G is designed as a multi-access platform to include unlicensed solutions like Wi-Fi. Its SIM-based security has a strong reputation for a faster adoption in private network. But 5G build can be costly when we compare to Wi-Fi. Also, 5G will require enterprise to invest in a new skill set because their existing IT department is fully aware of Wi-Fi, but now they have to venture and learn about radio and a cellular technology. As compared to 5G, Wi-Fi upgrades are much more simpler. Also, it will protect enterprises from their existing investment in Wi-Fi. But at the same time, Wi-Fi won't be ideal for a large outdoor or a long range use cases. So Wi-Fi will be essential to the success of 5G. So we have to see them as a complementary to each other. 5G is a business agenda to increase capacity and extend service offering, but at the same time reducing the cost. Wi-Fi help in achieving some of the, those basic principles of 5G. Wi-Fi and a 3GPP, which is a cellular technology, radio technology, the performance characteristics are converging day by day. We are seeing the convergence of some of the standards. Wi-Fi supports a robust, high capacity, inherently neutral host ecosystem with backward compatibility under enterprise control, but potentially accessible to the mobile network. So you can get best of the both world. 5G core network architecture has been decoupled from the 5G radio, and we are defining it agnostic to the local radio access technology, thus eroding the distinction between a trusted and a non-trusted access, which is being used by Wi-Fi. And thus, we are positioning Wi-Fi to become enterprise on-ramp on to the 5G network and 5G services. Any remaining or perceived gap between Wi-Fi and the cellular technology in terms of mobility, quality of experience indicators, or security, the ease of integrations, they are getting bridged by the predominance of technologies like 
पास पॉइंट डिस्कवरी और ऑथेंटिकेशन वाई फाई कॉलिंग एंड इनहेंस रिसोर्स मैनेजमेंट सम ऑफ द स्ट्रेटेजिक इन्वेस्टमेंट दैट इज ड्राइविंग एंटरप्राइज वाई फाई इनोवेशन इज इन एरिया ऑफ आई ओ टी डिजिटल वर्क स्पेस एंड अ वर्क प्लेस मोबिलिटी इफ यू लुक एट आई ओ टी देर इज नो सिंगल टेक्नोलॉजी विल एड्रेस ऑल द आई ओ टी रिक्वायरमेंट एज वी हैव अ लॉन्ग लिस्ट ऑफ वायरलेस आई ओ टी प्रोटोकॉल बट दिस इज लाइकली टू कंसॉलिडेट ओवर टाइम देर विल सर्टनली be a need for at least one open standardized technology for several key iot profile wifi can play that role given its low cost of roll out and maintenance and existing skill set availability by 2025 the total data volume of connected iot device is forecasted to reach more than 80 z the byte according to itc enterprise are working to securely onboard and manage the wide wide variety of iot devices using wifi for the iot platform hybrid workspace due to covid 19 office environment have evolved enterprise networks are more distributed than ever companies are focused on ensuring a safe return to work and investing in contact tracing solutions they are also focused on delivering as a in office experience for growing number of remote workers the enterprises that successfully enable a flexible secure and a scalable enterprise edge could realize up to 30% boost in productivity according to some of the research studies which has been done and the last plea will be a cellular convergence with a wifi 5g and wifi is going to work together to deliver better outcome which we are going to discuss in coming section so what are the challenges remote work and iot have led to a new challenges in term of poor user experience security and the manual processes we are seeing a poor user experience as more and more data is generated at the edge so there is a increase reliance on a low latency application this may contribute to unreliable performance and productivity loss as the data need to be processed or managed at the edge or by a distributed architecture in terms of security iot possesses one of the major challenges as most of the iot devices don't follow the strict protocol deployed by various enterprise and if we look at the manual processes still there are more than 10 hours per week is been spent by average network it engineer in resolving various wifi problem so the question remains how can the demand of a digital business best met aruba wifi platform delivers hardware and a software capabilities to meet enterprise need with seamless connectivity role based security and ai powered automation platform guaranteed performance of a latency sensitive bandwidth hungry and a iot enabled application with air slice platform provide enterprise class business continuity with live upgrade and clustering with zero touch provisioning platform can get remote workers in a branch offices up and running 
without much IT department support. Also, it support seamless 5G handover from voice and data with AirPass, as well as integration with a private mobile network. Aruba role-based policy enforcement, known as dynamic segmentation, offers deep control at the application, user, or a device level. And these policies are enforced across wire and wireless network. It offers secure guest access based on Wi-Fi 6 capabilities to provide secure guest access. It will help to eliminate the blind spot caused by IoT device by automatically discovering and profiling devices as they connect to Wi-Fi. Lastly, Aruba Wi-Fi provides secure segmentation known as multi-zone to simplify multi-tenant environment. Aruba goal is to make Wi-Fi easier to manage with AI-powered automation. This simplifies troubleshooting and improves the user experience. It improves user experience with seamless roaming and an intelligent RF capacity as well as coverage control with air match. Platform continuously monitor and steer traffic with client match to eliminate sticky client issues. It apply AI insight to rapidly surface and resolve issue. Use built-in config recommendation for a fast improvement. So what about supporting a hybrid workplace initiative? As I alluded to earlier, IT need to enable, need to be able to swiftly deal with performance or connectivity issues for remote workers. On top of that, they must ensure physical office location promotes safe, healthy work environment. With remote access point, one can extend enterprise services to the home. Once the remote access point or RAP is installed, employees see the same SSID as if they were in office. An automatic VPN connection means no special client software is needed and all the services that are available in the office are available at the home for the employees. This maintains the same corporate policies at the office which has been extended to the home. The workflow is simple. IT department ships an access point to employees' home. Employees plugs the access point in and downloads a configuration from the cloud. And that's all. From there on, the IT department can centrally manage the policy that grants the right user access to the right services. At the same time, the IT department gets the full visibility. At the same time, they can also assist in any troubleshoot from anywhere in the world. As an option, one can also deploy a plug and play VPN agents that equally easy for non IT personnel or employees to install and use what we call is VIA, Y software client. This is designed to turn a laptop, iPad, a phone into a VPN client. It is truly a personal solution. Aruba VIA provides secure remote connectivity for Android or Apple iOS or Mac 
for Linux and a Windows device to the enterprise resources. In this manner, one can leverage a cloud networking solution to monitor how these access points are performing, improving the help desk experience for the IT and at home experience for other employees. But what about employees who are returning to the office? This is where Aruba AI power technology once again come into the place with ready-made solution for contact tracing, for location tracing, and for hotspot mapping. Aruba Wi-Fi and Bluetooth services not only provide connectivity for sensors and other peripherals to monitor the health and the safety of employee, the data they produce is an essential ingredient for tracing of contact in event of health issues with the employee. This is different from other vendors attempt who stop at collecting and aggregating this raw location information. Aruba is using artificial intelligence to increase the value of location data by eliminating any unnecessary data and enhancing the data to make down the application more intelligent. For example, location data can indicate where two devices are connected in a close distance to each other. But what if, if there is a wall in between the two devices? That might have been considered a critical connection can be reduced in importance given there is a physical separation. Platform use AI to solve several key data problems so that both IT department and HR can trust the outcome where while more rapidly acting to protect the employees and organization. So coming back to the feature of tracing, Aruba provides Wi-Fi based and a Bluetooth based proximity solution. As mentioned, Aruba Wi-Fi solution works with any Aruba access point and the data can be harvested either from Airway or Aruba Central. Like all Aruba ESP AI Ops, Aruba Central is where the data is aggregated and analyzed. The data is then used by a new set of Aruba Central proximity services, which is contact tracing, location tracing, and a hotspot monitoring. Each of these services is hosted in Aruba Central UI, where dashboard, reports, filters, and drill downs are available under strict role-based access control. In addition, for customers who want to process the data in their own tool like Splunk, there is a set of API that can be used to extract this location data. So coming to Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi 6 is a flagship Wi-Fi standard in use since late 2018. Most of the flagship devices like iPhone 11, Samsung Galaxy S10, S21, every device comes with Wi-Fi 6 enabled. Wi-Fi 6 is fully compatible with all the legacy like devices like 4. 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz frequency. So what are the key benefits of Wi-Fi 6? The first and the foremost is Wi-Fi 6 support higher bandwidth and higher density. This made it made Wi-Fi 6 ideal for AR, VR and some of the other low latency use case. Wi-Fi 6 is IoT ready, it supports multiple wireless technology. Wi-Fi 6 is more efficient and enables more 
vendor specific differentiator. So how it is better than Wi-Fi 5, which is the older generation or existing generation. Wi-Fi 6 is over four times the performance improvement over Wi-Fi 5. Because it leverages some of the new Wi-Fi technology like OF, DMA, TWT, Massive MIMO, QM. At the same time, Wi-Fi 6 has a higher security as compared to 555. Some of the key use cases where Wi-Fi 6 will be beneficial are application assurance. To mitigate, to mitigate poor connectivity experience, we can use Wi-Fi 6 to optimize radio resources for guaranteed network access, indoor wireless coverage, inconsistent indoor cellular coverage can be solved by Wi-Fi 6 as compared to small cell or a DES alternatives intelligent edge. As more and more data is being generated at the edge, Wi-Fi 6 can be used to bridge the connectivity to have edge computing and edge analytics. Wi-Fi 6 adoption is much faster than any other Wi-Fi generations. Wi-Fi 6 is going to usher in new project to refresh the rest of the networks, which has not been done for many years. But certification is a key requirement for interoperability and a feature parity. Aruba Wi-Fi 6 is the first portfolio of certified product, and also it has the widest range. Aruba is the only vendor today with remote teleworker and outdoor Wi-Fi 6 access point. We are seeing an emergence of a new trend or a technology. We call them as a Wi-Fi 6E e extended. Wi-Fi 6E extend the benefit of Wi-Fi 6 to 6 gigahertz band. Please do note, different countries are opening different portion of the band to Wi-Fi community. But overall, all the countries is going to benefit from more adjacent spectrum to meet the growing need of bandwidth. It will also give wider channels for bandwidth intensive application at the same time a zero interference coming from electronic devices which runs in the normal Wi-Fi band. Wi-Fi 6E differentiate access to the channels by device clients. And we are going to see a different type of uh, access point, like a low power indoor access point, standard power access point, and a very, very low power access point in coming years. Today, Wi-Fi support offload of 54% of mobile data traffic. And this is set to grow to about 70% with 5G. The paradox of 5G is that faster speed drive more usage, which then require more Wi-Fi offload to meet cost. Both enterprise and mobile operators are going through their own digital transformation journey. And there is at least one parallel that can be drawn between them they are both building up intelligence at their own edges, or we call them as an intelligent edge. This intelligent edge will produce the real time inside deliver digital services and the result in real time. On one hand, enterprises are becoming more data driven, connecting IoT sensors and devices building up their IT infrastructure closer to the devices which is generating the data. 
we call them as an enterprise edge. This enterprise edge enable enterprises to process, analyze more data faster and obtain a real time insight. Furthermore, intelligent edge will be the one that will bridge the 5G features into the enterprise. On the other hand, mobile operators like Globe Telecom is also undergoing their own digital transformation. First by virtualizing their core data center into cloud, which is going to deliver network function. Then by building up IT infrastructure where it is close to the user and the mobile device, we call that as a telco edge. This will enable the operators to process the data closer to the user and extend the new 5G features from the core to the edge. More importantly, it will allow them to offer IT services to enterprises through this infrastructure and in a way that is a converge with mobility and their network provide. In both digital transformation trend, Wi-Fi 6 is going to play a critical role in enabling data processing, delivery of digital services, application and connectivity closer to the user. And it relates to 5G being a complement and an enabler for the delivery of a 5G radio into enterprise. So thank you very much. I hope you like this session. Please drop me a message if you have a further queries. Thank you very much. Get it.